Good morning, evening, or night, everybody. I'm Jext, and in this video, I'm going to be breaking down every single second, frame, and pixel in the Splatoon 3 Direct. And I mean everything. From the weapons, to the characters, to the lore, updates, cosmetics, customization, and information supplied afterwards on Twitter and the official Splatoon 3 website will be covered in this video. Now, this is going to be a long video, and I'll be covering everything the, about the Direct and its topics in chronological order of how they appeared, but with a few slight caveats. And in preparation of that, I have time-stamped everything in this video that I will be talking about down in the description below. So if you just have to know about a specific piece of information, you can check down there and find it. And since this video is so long, up front, please make sure to like and subscribe and comment and all that good stuff, as this video took a ton of time to make. It means a lot to me, and it lets me know that you guys want to see more and you enjoyed this. And now that that's out of the way, buckle up, Inklings, Octolings, and little buddies. We are off to the Splatlands. Now the very first thing we see is this wonderful Nintendo Switch logo. Now Nintendo is a global video game company founded in Kyoto, Japan in 1889. Nah, I'm just messing with you. Let's get to the Splatoon 3, baby. For real though, the first thing we do see is this lovely clipboard graphic telling us that this is the Splatoon 3 Direct presentation, obviously keeping up with the real life lore that the developers of the games are in fact just researchers reporting on the locations and characters of the game. Sadly though, this Direct does not feature our good old friend Mr. Nogami, but we do have a wonderful bubbly narrator, at least for the English version, to guide us through anyway. Now, we open the Direct with the same sun glare and sky shot we saw in the announcement trailer, and then it cuts to this rusted out subway car stuck in the ground with some graffiti on it, as well as this rusted out car and another subway car as the camera pans to the right. Obviously we've seen this arid, dry area in the announcement trailer as it seems to be the outskirts of Splatsville in the Splatlands, and a similar locale to the Scorch Gorge stage. Our next shot cuts to Splatsville, and boy is it packed with a ton of signage and these large apartment buildings making up a significant portion of the background. These buildings kind of resemble those of places like Japan and Hong Kong where space is limited and apartments are packed in tightly and efficiently and tend to be built higher rather than wider. Now all the signage, graffiti, and this main storefront kind of really tie together this corner of Splatsville as a snapshot of a chaotic city tying to the theming after, the, after one of the final Splatoon 2 Splatfests, Chaos vs. Order, in which Chaos won. We can see to the upper left a little bit of an inkling sitting on a railing and sort of a camo textured object above it. This will be shown a bit more in just a second though. Above the street we can see subway rails which is one of the way the inklings get to the city which we also did see in the announcement trailer as well. We can actually see the subway itself a little at the top left and the bottom right. We can also see this red mailbox similar to the one in Splatoon 2, and yes, this is where you can submit drawings, which carries over the Miiverse-esque feature present all the way back in Splatoon 1. This is confirmed later in the Direct that it is the mailbox, but I thought I'd just get it out of the way now. I think it's really, really nice that they kept this feature in, as they could have easily just cut it out, but honestly, it remains just another thing that makes Splatoon unique, and the plaza, hub areas, and stages feel so lively and ever-changing. Our view then cuts to this shot of a back alley, which shows us some squid graffiti on this pole, some blue and pink paper lanterns, the above subway track, and a lot of ivy. Most of the greenery in the previous games' as hubs was potted plants, so some wild, unkempt plant life just contributes more to that chaos feel. We then get shown a view that mirrors the initial shot of Splatsville, this time down the street. That camo texture from before is actually much larger than we initially saw, but we can't quite make out what it is yet. We can clearly make out a large blue and white pig though, which might be one of the hub's large statues, like the tortoise and paper crane in Splatoon 2, and the kitsune and tanuki in Splatoon 1. This could continue the tradition of having some sort of animal statue with ties to Japanese mythology in the hub area. The pig itself 
sits on a large archway with these weathered, oxidized, copper-looking tips. I really enjoy this blend of old and new in Splatsville, and we're only going to see more of it going forward. As we keep looking from this angle, we can see that this is a one-lane street with branching alleyways and a lot of storefronts. If we look at where the initial point of view is from, we can actually see some sort of shrine archway behind it, leading to a larger shrine-like building behind it. Splatsville kind of seems to be this metropolitan area juxtaposed with traditional Japanese architectural elements, which really gives it a unique feel that neither Splatoon 1 nor 2's hubs had. The narrator also does mention that the city's old-fashioned appearance and how it has grown tremendously over the years, solidifying the lore that the city has been around a long time, but is modernizing quite chaotically. I'm sorry, I had to. And if my eyes don't deceive me, there is also what looks like a manhole right behind the starting point of view, but we'll get a better look at that a little later. Our next shot gives us a ground up view, and we see the height of the apartment buildings, the power lines, the subway rail, and the subway itself, and what looks to be a brown crown of some sort. The next shot is chock full of stuff to look at though. We will start with this motorcycle in the foreground left. Its license plate, the boxes on it, and various signage in the shot actually do have the square inkling script on them, which to the best of my knowledge is all gibberish. I tried translating it since this script has been deciphered courtesy of Maid Cactus and Rassicus, but using that all these words are probably just filler to give the items more visual interest. As far as I know, this is the first time I've seen a motorcycle in Splatoon, though, and its keys have a little tiny squid hanging from them, so that's cool. We do get a look at this funny little graffiti sticker of a hand pressing a button on this middle white sign, and honestly, a lot of the new graffiti tags and stickers in this game really look pretty cool, and I cannot wait to... well, we'll get to that later. In the foreground still, but on the bottom right behind our little Inkling friend here, we can see a storefront that sells Inkling phones and other related tech. I wonder if Inklings have some squid version of a cell phone carrier. Ink TNT maybe? Eh, I don't know. In the background though, we do see some Inklings in a larger building with what looks like a large wooden snake on it. The crown from the previous shot sits on top of this, and the building itself is home to Ammo Knights, shown by the partially covered logo on the side here. Next to that building is the main tower, where presumably all the battles take place, as you can barely see the top of the Squid Force logo just behind the bike's handlebars. Various Inklings are walking around here, and the jellies are present as usual, and this weird looking dude in a blue jumpsuit is standing around as well. Something to note is that an inkling here, and the one from before, are above the ground level, which indicates some sense of verticality to the hub area, something we haven't seen in Splatoon 2 at all, and we barely saw in Splatoon 1, as the only verticality that hub had was the staircase that led up to the studio where you could watch Callie and Marie. Our next shot gives us a very clean view of the front of the battle tower, as well as some inklings and octolings. As a side note, throughout the trailer, I won't mention much about the gear that Inklings and Octolings are wearing because, honestly, if I tried to make a full list of all the gear showcased in this Direct, this video would be so much longer. Maybe I'll make a separate video on all the gear, but just assume right now that most of the gear from the previous games is returning, plus all of the new gear that they're showing off. Anyway, we can see this subway sign on the left, denoting that there might be an underground station of some sort. Could the Deep Sea Metro from Octo Expansion be returning? I don't know, that's probably a stretch, but it's fun to think about. Above the sign sits what looks like another large statue, and I can't quite make out what it is. Next to it, though, is a large glass window with a sign that seemingly reads Korea RPO, which is a piece of graffiti or signage that's present in Splatoon 2, but again, it's mostly gibberish. It seems to have some tables and chairs in it. Maybe it's a cafe or something similar to the place where Spike sat in Splatoon 2. Last thing of note in this shot is right above the Battle Tower logo is some text. And I don't know what the first word reads, but the second one is definitely the word 3. 
The next shot of Splatsville shows us a large green elevated walkway of sorts, lending credibility to the idea of traversable verticality in the hub. It would be nice to get a bird's eye view of the plaza for once. There's also some flowers, a spray paint can, a blue lantern like from the alleyway before, and some billboards all the way up on top of the buildings. As well as a gigantic plane that flies directly over the city. This also has some text on the bottom of its wings, but I couldn't quite make out the script and it's probably gibberish anyway. Now as we fade into a better view of the main plaza, we can orient ourselves a little bit better. The main tower is up the stairs, with the shoal to its right. Ammo Knights currently sits right in front on that corner of the street that we looked down before. The area with the motorcycle is behind our current point of view, and the manhole and the shrine are to the left of this current point of view. So this hub area already seems dramatically bigger than Splatoon 1 or 2 already. And to get a look at it, I actually made a rough sketch of the map using our available waypoints. This is the main intersection with Ammo Knights on the corner. The main shops are also on this street, and that's shown later in the direct. That blue pig statue is actually even farther down the street, just hidden from view right here. Hot Lantis, another shop that is shown later in the direct, is right here, as the snake from the initial shot confirms the location since it is to our left in the opening shot, meaning Ammo Knights is across the street from Hot Lantis. The other corner behind the current point of view has the manhole and the shrine area further to the left, which we can verify using this shot with the blue pig as we can see the snake on top of Ammo Knights in that shot. The area with the motorcycle is just a dead end, shown right back in the first shot, and you can also even see the motorcycle just barely in that shot too. We know the mailbox is right outside Hotlantis here, and that gives us a better picture of the area as a whole. Now I'll try to update this map as we see more of the hub throughout the direct, so don't worry, but at least right now the area we've seen has been pretty big and there's probably even more of it to discover. Now back to analyzing the shot itself. Across from the snake is what looks like a duck or a chicken headed statue holding some sort of blue and gold orb with symbols on it. So maybe it's another significant shop that's right underneath it or maybe it's just another statue in the plaza. This blue overall dude stands in front of Hotlantis but we'll get to him later. Also, the snake's tail kind of resembles the head of an RPG, tying into Ammonites' weapon theming. The battle tower also has a skywalk on the very top, leading to some other building crossing over what seems to be a large road. Splatsville kind of seems like it's sort of smashed into a larger metropolitan area, but it still has some nice palm trees too. After our introduction to the city, we finally get to see an inkling in action with the slightly shinier Splattershot Jr. and a highway sign above them. This area is Eeltail Alley, as we will see in a little bit. Squid form has a more pronounced gradation from yellow to purple. We also get to see the slightly altered icon for the ink tank and its refill here as well. It's more sharp and angular and kind of looks like a ketchup squeeze bottle to me, but as the video shows, it's more of a juice pouch looking device with the red light atop it to show if you can use a sub weapon and if you have special. A slight change is that the indicator for how much ink your sub weapon uses out of the total tank is now this red line instead of a red arrow. It's a bit clearer and easier to see, so that's a welcome change. As I said before, this area is Eeltail Alley because this is the long bridge in the middle of it, and these squid highway road signs show up later when this stage is shown off again. We can still see the elevated subway in the back in the apartment building, so this map is really close to the main plaza area. After seeing the squid leap off the main bridge, we catch a, a Takaroka logo on this block on the far right with an X and then it cuts off, maybe meaning that Takaroka has a collaboration with another brand as this is kind of a common visual indicator of collaborations between two things. Like this example of Super Smash Bros Ultimate and Kingdom Hearts, or just real life fashion. I do kind of hope that the fashion brands in games start doing collabs as that kind of opens the door for a ton of unique looking gear and maybe some unique abilities too. We also see that the main shirt that this Inkling is wearing has three pieces of duct tape on it, which is kind of consistent with Splatoon 3's branding up to this point, which features a lot of duct tape for some reason. 
The inkling itself shows us the shirt because they're doing the booyah emote, which returns with its associated sound effect, meaning that you can still booyah to your heart's content. And as shown later in the direct, the this way command is back as well. But they do remain the only two ways to communicate with your team in battle if you're not using voice chat. We also get a snapshot of a squid coming out of the ink with a huge skull fossil behind it, possibly on Scorch Gorge. Followed by a snapshot of something we've already seen from previous trailers, a team spawning into a match on their cappuccino maker-like drone things. The textures and the crispness of the weapons and the clothes looks fantastic here. I also love the evolution of the spawning in these games, initially being in like tea kettles or coffee makers to now a full-on espresso machine that flies. We also get some stills of these inklings in the middle of the new spawn mechanic, some using weapons, some chilling out in Splatsville. There's also a Trizuka still, which is interesting because it shows a bottle flying off the weapon, which is an indicator that one of the shots of the weapon has been used up, since it only has three. And as you will see, Splatoon 3 is leaning relatively hard into the theme of being the third game. We also get obvious confirmation that everything said about Inklings applies to the Octolings, as this one does flips on Eeltail Alley. And later on we're shown that Inklings now have the ability to choose an emote, so I assume this is just one of them done on a map. We also get confirmation that pigeons are back, baby! Rise up, my pigeon army! We then get into Turf War with this cool graphic showing us the various behaviors of Inklings and Octolings. One's changing shoes, one's going over weapons, some are planning, and others are just mean mugging each other. The Viking Helmet Inkling actually holds the Sea Cucumber phone that will be shown in a little bit greater detail later on in the Direct. The squids show off some new gear and some returning weapons once again, demonstrating the increased quality of textures and weapon models. Then we get an overhead view of Turf War on Scorch Gorge. Here we see that the disclaimer that additional games and systems are required for multiplayer, as well as the fossil skull from earlier in the bottom left. We also get a cleaner view of Scorch Gorge now, seeing it's rather wide with some large graded bridges, ramps, and some blocks and walls to hide behind. It seems more open than other maps in the series, and I think it will have a lot of paths for different modes. I can see the splatlings and other weapons that like greats being relatively popular here. And I do really love the aesthetic of this map with these large rock formations that seemingly are carved due to wind erosion that are reminiscent of similar formations in the American Southwest and other desert regions of the world. The map itself seems to be under construction with this scaffolding and sheet metal and other materials all around. And jellies can be seen in the background on these large pipe structures and the rock formations too. Now the yellow team here features from left to right a tri stringer, a splatter shot, a slosher, and an octo brush. While the purple team features a splat charger, a 52 gal, a splatter shot pro, with the fourth being unseen, but it's a splat roller. The promotional material for Splatoon, the entire series, typically sticks weapons with a specific inkling in a certain outfit, and I'll use that principle later on when going through weapon kits and such. And to touch on that, I won't be covering the weapon kits as they come up, but I'll do a brief recap with evidence of each one near the end of the video. We then head to another battle and get to see the weapons on each team are the same, but this time the orange has the Splattershot Pro, Splat Roller, Splat Charger, and 52, and the teal team has the Stringer, Splattershot, Slosher, and Octobrush. The teams blast off as Turf War is confirmed to yet again be 4 on 4 and 3 minutes long. Same rules because, well, it's not broken. They don't have to fix it. The map this time is Mincemeat Metalworks, hence the large stacks of scrap metal, the big scrap crane, and the huge beached ships. The map itself is rectangular with a decent amount of verticality. Some grates are present in the middle and the spawning sides of the map. And the map itself has about four levels of depth with the middle being the deepest. There's lots of places on this one to use Squid Surge. We can also see the jellies with their hard hats moving around as the match goes on, and if I see correctly, one of them drives a forklift, which means we're in the presence of a forklift certified individual. 
Now, the Slosher on the top uses Triple Inch Strike throughout this match, which draws a parallel from Splatoon 1's Slosher kit, which had just a regular Ink Strike. We can also see how Triple Ink Strike functions as the Slosher throws the little beacons and the strikes come flying in. A definite improvement to the slow, sluggish Ink Strike from Splatoon 1. This special will kind of really depend on how the player places their beacons, as the Ink Strike's main function is paint and forcing players to move, much like the Booyah Bomb. I can see the Triple Ink Strike also used to clear the tower, impede the Rainmaker, and is a great way to wall opponents out of choke points on maps, rather than being a really splat focused special like Ink Jet. We can also see while this is happening, the Orange Octobrush uses Zipcaster, and the 52 Gal uses Killer Whale 5.1. Zipcaster is a relatively easy special to understand as you just get zipped to wherever you choose to go, and then return to where you initiated it after a little bit like Inkjet. Killer Whale locks onto enemies, but it can be moved to, to lock on to a different one after it's initially locked on. We can see that as it initially locks on to this player, but it's then moved to target the Teal Slosher. We can also see the Killer Whale from like Splatoon 1 passes through everything on the map, meaning that hiding behind walls won't save you on this one. The Splatter Shot gets its Trizuka during this mess and it shoots its three volleys at various points, once again keeping in line with the 3 theme. And its last shot is actually directly at the Splatter Shot Pro, which activates its Crab Tank special. It seems to be a direct hit from the Trizuka, but it doesn't splat the crab tank user so either the crab tank itself gains some sort of armor or invincibility can block shots or it actually wasn't a direct hit but we can see the crab tank has a decent amount of range in its automatic firing mode reaching this elevated platform in the middle of the map it also fires one of its larger blasts which travels the same distance of its rapid fire shots but it has a similar explosion radius to the trizuka itself the Teal Stringer then activates their Killer Whale 5.0 and it locks onto two opponents simultaneously here, tracking them both at the same time. It seems that this special actually ends in waves, with the top two speakers disappearing first, then the middle two, and then the bottom two. We then get to see a similar result screen with a MUCH fuzzier and wild looking Lil Judd. A splash of graffiti and stickers appears at the top of the screen as well, giving more flair to the result screen than usual. And I gotta say, I really love this graffiti. The wild green squid with its tongue sticking out looks so sick. And this sticker here actually resembles one that's present on the cover of a front row record so that's pretty dope too following that we get to see the tri stringer fire horizontally and it covers a decent amount of ink as well as inking its feet when it shoots the short bursts file three projectiles horizontally while on the ground as opposed to when you jump or are airborne with the weapon where it fires them vertically we also see an inkling sneak up on an unsuspecting opponent and they move slowly in the ink without leaving any trails which is important for sharking if you don't have ninja squid the 52 gal seems to have the same fire rate and range as the as its Platoon 2 counterpart in this clip that shows off the ink recovery mechanic for beginners. I like this new geometric refilling animation on the bar leading to the ink tank here though. It's a cool little graphical change. Squid Surge is then shown off and we now know that you need to charge it up before it activates and then it shoots you up a wall. Obviously this creates a a weakness is you're vulnerable for a moment while you're charging up and it doesn't really help on super short walls. But you can actually squid search to gain extra height and surprise your opponent. This mechanic opens up a world of opportunity, especially if you can use it on the sides of short walls to get super high up. I do see it becoming kind of like Splashdown in Splatoon 2 though, where players just get used to the height that it launches you to and they can just snap up and splat you but nonetheless it'll be a fun mechanic and it has some great utility. There's also really no confirmation if you can use it while holding the Rainmaker or if it has any effect on any clams you hold during clam blitz. Like in Splatoon 2 if you jump back to your spawn with clams you lose all the clams so if you squid surge with clams do you keep them? Do you lose them? I don't know. You can also glow when you use Squid Surge from the moment you take off until just before you land, possibly to distinguish players who are actually using the ability to those who are just falling in the air. We then get to see Squid Roll, and after months of speculation, we finally get confirmation that it repels ink or nullifies some amount of damage from opponents while glowing. 
in a small aside here, a Japanese television ad that was released after the Direct shows that this armor type state can be broken. As this Tri Stringer Squid rolls away but gets its armor type thing broken by a sloshing machine direct. Now this technique or maneuver or whatever you want to call it allows you to turn around instantly and it does not consume any ink, making firefights with enemies and just general movement so much more varied. I am not overstating this when I say that this mechanic will revolutionize how Splatoon is played, simply because players will have to anticipate their enemies using it and be able to adjust their aim and positioning accordingly kind of like how Dooley's impacted Splatoon 2 early on in its meta. It seems to me that it's going to be an essential tool for movement, positioning, dodging, 1v1s, etc. The two new maneuvers alone give so many different options to players and impacts how map designs will be seen going forward as walls now actually have way more utility and importance than before and openness and room to squid roll becomes a larger factor. Also, both of these abilities will most certainly be used to get out of bounds or to areas the developers did not intend, and I cannot wait to see all the shortcuts and out of bounds shenanigans that people come up with when the game launches. Now, the weapons themselves are also greatly impacted by Squid Roll, especially chargers and other weapons that can only really shoot one shot at a time, like blasters. Going for directs and hitting charger shots is going to be more difficult, as Squid Roll can just be used to juke or mess up your aim. Rollers and brushes will probably be fine, but weapons like brellas and shooters will have to learn how to reposition to effectively deal with the ability. Ultimately though, the effectiveness of squid rolling and squid surge will depend on the user, how and when they use it. That said, I cannot wait to try it out. Next up, we've got stages in this cool jelly that's kind of rock climbing. What can't these little dudes do? Now, the Splatland stages at launch are shown to be Scorch Gorge, Eel Tail Alley, Mincemeat Metalworks, and Undertow Spillway. We've already covered the first three, but Undertow Spillway was actually only shown off on Splatoon's Twitter on June 17th. It's a flood bypass that has been abandoned for a while and has been upcycled into a Turf War stage. The stage fits the theming of Splatoon, kind of taking place after sea levels rise due to flooding. But this area being abandoned might mean that sea levels have evened out or even receded a little bit in, in this time period. The undertow in the stage name actually refers to the undertow phenomenon, which is an undercurrent that moves offshore while waves approach the shore. It also occurs in almost any large body of water and is often confused with riptides. And a spillway is a structure that is used to provide the controlled release of water from a levee or a dam during floods. So now you know why it's called that. The stage itself features a decent amount of uninkable glass structures and a ton of ramps without a lot of pure open flat ground at all. The background shows more of the large glass and concrete columns as well as some jellies chilling by some flowers and one in a hard hat over here. This stage, along with some others shown off later, give me the feeling that the developers might be loving big vertical columns for some reason on maps. A new never before seen stage, Hagglefish Market, makes its appearance next. The name obviously refers to, well, haggling prices at a fish market. And there's no such thing as a hagglefish, but a hagfish is a real creature. And it probably inspired at least a little bit of the name as well. A hagfish is an ancient, jawless vertebrate fish that produces a lot of slime and gets confused for an eel. Creepy. Anyway, the market stage has a prominent ink rail in this shot, as well as seaside and market decor like tents and booths with jelly selling their wares. We also get to see this sponge later on in the Splatana reveal, but we'll get to that. The map itself is a, is a skinny rectangle, so weapons like Killer Whale 5.1 and longer range main weapons might be stronger here. The background also shows a seaside market town with a lot of shacks on the water, but a large gleaming city behind it, probably where Splatsville is located. Overall, I really love the aesthetic of this stage, and with Stingray gone, long, skinny stages are going to be much more fun to play on. After that, we see some jellies seemingly building some tables and stuff as well as some little small baby jelly running around, while we get news that stages from Greater Inkopolis are returning. Museum D'Alfonsino, which was shown off in September of 2021 and in an early trailer for the game, is brought back up here. This modern museum from Splatoon 1 didn't really get much of a facelift for Splatoon 3, and it still has its central mechanic being these large spinning walls. A clam is shown in this case with eyes that I think are kind of similar to the Super Sea Snail, as well as a fire hydrant 
Maybe implying that Inklings know how to light stuff on fire. Uh, Hammerhead Bridge from Splatoon 1 makes its triumphant return with an absolutely major upgrade, as well as a sneaky little detail in the background. The bridge itself connects Greater Inkopolis to the Splatlands, making transit to and from much easier, and the bridge itself has been under construction since Splatoon 1, but it's now finished. So either the construction jellies are really slow workers, or this bridge is just a massive infrastructure project. Because even in the background, these jellies are all around the stage, still moving on scaffolding and stuff. In terms of actual gameplay though, players will battle under the actual bridge section of the map, and it, the map itself retains its skinny, linear structure, although this time with a noticeable lack of grades. Like I said before, without Stingray, longer, skinnier stages are way better off now, and even with its facelift, Hammerhead looks really fun, and like it retains the sign of core vibe that the original had. A lot of elevation changes, places to hide, and a decent map for blasters and chargers. A fun side that is not seen in the North American Direct, due to the fact that the stage name is so long in English, is, well... The following is a spoiler for Splatoon 2's Octo Expansion. The Nil statue from the final boss of the Octo Expansion is actually just chilling in the water off the coast. It's a pretty super cool detail and a reference to Octo Expansion. Kind of sucks that if you watch the North American Direct, you just literally couldn't see it. And it probably doesn't mean anything lore-wise lore like Professor Tartar is returning or anything. Right? Right? Next up is a fan favorite that's also back, Mahi Mahi Resort, the stage in a giant squid-shaped pool where jellies party all day long. The stage has been restructured quite heavily, featuring way less water-raising sections and a more streamlined kind of three-block design. I think that there could be alternate looks for it for ranked modes, but in general, they definitely strip the stage down quite a bit. There is still the water raising sections that become inkable after a certain amount of time has passed in battle, but the snipe area and the spawns have been reworked to be more open with less cover. It might end up being a blessing though, as the simplification could make the map easier to play on and maneuver around. There also seems to be bounce pads from hero mode on here as well, which could be really really fun to mess around with. And I'm always for implementing more things from hero mode into multiplayer. In the back you can actually see what seems to be a gazebo with some jellies under it, a large inflatable squid, and a jelly band on stage jamming out. Could they be the next great Splatoon band? Who knows? Now after seeing those we get a quick confirmation that four maps from Splatoon 2, Inkblot Art Academy, Sturgeon Shipyard, Mako Mart, and Wahoo World are returning. So Splatoon 3 on launch will have stages from across the series. Five new ones that are exclusive to this game, three from Splatoon 1, and four from Splatoon 2. Crushing the previous game's totals of just five and eight maps at launch for Splatoon and Splatoon 2 respectively. But that's not all for stages. More will come, of course, with a reworked Flounder Heights from Splatoon 1 on the left here and a sort of Egyptian squid pyramid looking stage being teased on the right. And these will all be in free future updates. Now Flounder seems to have ditched its super giant walls and the huge ramps for a more grounded approach, but it still has more verticality than other stages, and I expect Squid Sturge to be very useful on this map, and hopefully it's a blaster haven. The Egyptian theme stage seems to have a large open middle area surrounded by this elevated scaffolding and ramps leading upward, but due to the kind of weird camera angle we're at, not much else can be seen here. It does have these large squid statues, which is cool, and maybe the Inklings built the Great Pyramids, I don't know. But both maps are interesting and confirm the game will have at least 14 maps, with most likely way more than that. Now we get to the weapons, and after seeing some dope 2D illustrations of these weapons, we get confirmation that all main weapons will be back in Splatoon 3. So at least 50 weapons not counting variants. So if we include two kits for each main weapon, that's at least a hundred weapons in this game. So it'll definitely have something for everybody. Pry Stringer gets a little bit of a showcase again with its fast horizontal and vertical firing as well as its charge shot being shown off. 
This weapon does seem to cover quite a bit of ink and has some long range firepower due to the charge shot. I kind of see it like a charger brella hybrid since it fires sort of a shotgun blast like the brella but it can also have a one hit kill charge shot like a charger. I'm definitely looking forward to this weapon and trying it out and also this cool little astronaut graffiti on this block looks super dope. Next up we get a brand new weapon class. This one resembles a car windshield wiper blade with a sponge on it. The Splatana is the weapon that this class belongs to. Its thin and wiry design does resemble a katana which is probably where it gets its name. We do get to see one weapon in this class, the Splatana Wiper. Every strike sends a blade of ink horizontally at a decent distance, maybe the range of like a 96 gal. You can also charge up for this fierce vertical slash that's called a charge slash that shoots a vertical blade of ink forward while the inkling moves forward a bit and it also does more damage. The weapon doesn't seem to really paint that well, so I think it'll probably be more of a rush down spat focus weapon. The trailer shows a long range charge shot slash plus two quick ones is a splat. Later in the direct we do see in the testing room that it does do 30 damage per short per horizontal slash and at least 60 damage with a charge slash at distance. So it's a four shot like Octobrush with its horizontal slashes, but it can be a one shot like a roller with its charge slash up close which does 120 damage. You also get launched forward a little, kind of in the air when you do a charge slash as the inkling in the trailer does a charge slash in midair and flies over some enemy ink. So I think ink resistance is definitely going to be an important ability for this weapon. The charge slash itself doesn't take much ink and neither do the regular slashes for that matter, making this weapon seem relatively ink efficient. Perhaps we'll see a slower, more ink hungry powerful version as well, wink wink. Either way, this has to be inspired by the Octo Samurai fight from Splatoon 2's hero mode, right? Now on to the special weapons and a better look at the heads up display or HUD. We see here that the weapons at the top of the screen are now displayed as 2D icons instead of 3D like in Splatoon 2 as well as confirmation of the Booyah and This Way command. We saw Killer Whale 5.1 in action earlier but we see it again here and it splats its opponents relatively quickly. But with the incorporation of Squid Roll I see this special being more easily avoided making it more efficient to use it as a nuisance and chip damage special that catches you off guard and makes you move around a lot rather than a straight up death machine. Still it'll be really useful to clear people off of the tower, scatter people out of the zone, target the rainmaker and people with power clams but way less effective and way less annoying than stingray ever was. We also get new specials and they're incoming right now. First up is the Tacti Cooler, a tactical cooler. And I have to say this is very fitting that they showed off a large fridge in the shape of a can that is thrown in the grocery store stage Mako Mart. This special is a cooler that expands, plays a cute little jingle, and holds out four drinks for you and your teammates to grab that give you a variety of effects. From what I can see, it increases your run speed, swim speed, reduces your squid surge charge time, and your shot RNG after squid surge and squid roll. So it essentially gives you the run speed and swim speed up abilities, as well as the new ability which we'll see in a bit, intensify action. I also assume it kind of acts like opening gambit does, but instead of at the beginning of the match, you just get the buffs when you grab the drink. The special is not global like Ink Armor or Tenom Missiles, which is fantastic, since the reason Ink Armor was so strong is that it always applied everything to everyone no matter where they were on the map, and it gave people extra health. The Tactic Cooler does not give you extra health, and it's great because it means that teams will have to be smarter about how they use it and they deploy it because you have to go grab the drink, so you have to be able to grab it without getting splatted to get the effects of it. As well as it's a passive boost that enhances your ability, not something that makes you invincible or be able to tank a lot of hits. It's unknown right now how long its effects last, but I would say a rough guess would maybe be 10 to 15 seconds. Also during this segment, we can see that Makomart really hasn't changed its design at all. The next new special we get to see is the Wave Breaker, which is a large ball that sort of slams down into this net and sends waves throughout the map at an unknown distance that marks opponents and does damage. The inklings in this clip get splatted after three waves and standing in a bit of enemy ink, so I assume the wave does amount maybe 30 to 35 damage. The special does have a really easy weakness though, just jump over the waves. 
I see this as another special that would be more of a nuisance and chip damage one than rather a straight up killer, but I do like the trend we are seeing of specials that complement and round out weapons kits rather than just acting as something to spam a bunch or use as a delete button. I can imagine having wave breaker in a splat zone, around the basket and clam blitz, or in front of or behind the tower and rainmaker, as that would be super useful to keep people out, or at least make them jump and reveal themselves, lest they be marked while in ink anyway. It's a great special for forcing people out of hiding because of that, as they either have to jump over the wave and risk themselves being seen, or get marked by the wave. They could also run away from the wave, although the clip does not show if the wave keeps going and going throughout the whole map, or if it has a set radius that it goes to. It also isn't known if this special can be destroyed, and if you can just shoot it and break it like a splash wall, then it'll probably be pretty weak. Either way, I really like how it incorporates echolocation back into Splatoon, and gives it some oomph as well. We can also see that Wahoo World hasn't changed at all either, and it seems like the Splatoon 2 stages that are returning at launch won't be changed much or at all. After we see that, we have the final new special, the Reef Slider. This is a large pool inflatable that you ride forward until it explodes like a ball or a splashdown. This special does kill instantly upon its explosion and covers a decent amount of turf and distance as it launches forward. My initial thoughts on this are kind of mostly questions, like does it do damage if it touches somebody while you're launching forward? If so, how much? Can it be broken? Does it offer any extra health while riding? Can you be splatted while you're exploding? It does take some shots from the Hydra here and no visible damage is on the Inkling and there's kind of a unique sound effect when the Hydra's shots hit the inflatable so maybe it has some invincibility? Listen carefully right here to hear that little sound effect. Once the attack I do like the fact that it is a pool inflatable with a muzzle on it, because it's a shark I guess, and that the rails that it sets when it launches forward are actually pool lane dividers, and that these large soda bottles propel it forward. The pool lane dividers actually spread and fly out during the explosion giving it a cool little visual effect. This special kind of seems like a combination of baller and splashdown to me. High risk, high reward, but it'll probably fall to the wayside at high level competition because of its glaring weaknesses. Once players learn the distance it travels and the weaknesses of it, all they have to do is shoot slightly ahead of it and the player will run right into their shots and die, or you can just squid roll out of the way of it. Also, there's no mention of what happens if you run into a wall with it. Do you just instantly blow up? Do you continue to run into the wall and then blow up? I don't know. I do think it's funny, it's cool looking, it has some cool visual effects, but I don't know if it'll be that great. And once again, Sturgeon Shipyard doesn't look like it's been changed. And a surprise to, I think, everyone is that Splatoon 2 specials are returning. Tenta Missiles, Inkjet, Inkstorm, Ultra Stamp, and Booyah Bomb are confirmed coming back. None of them seem to have been changed at all, but we did only get a few seconds of each in action. I know many people want missiles to be heavily nerfed or reworked since they are so spammable and good in Splatoon, or just not in Splatoon 3, but they're here. They seem to work the same as this Inkling does fire 16 missiles, meaning it has targeted 4 opponents and fired 4 missiles each. I really think that missiles only needs a few small changes, like either have the missiles that land not count as paint towards the next set of missiles or have a smaller reticle so it's harder to target a lot of players or if you can't target people all the way across the map. That would cut down on the spamming and the effectiveness of them tremendously. But the inclusion of squid roll as a movement technique makes it much easier to get away from missiles as they, it did trap really slow weapons in Splatoon 2 really easily, but with this fast universal movement technique that's on everything, that's a thing of the past. All the other specials seem to be the exact same. I think it's interesting to have all these specials return, as I think the balance of this game is going to get kind of insane, even from the jump, and most people kind of already know how to use these specials, so the skill level is already higher. This is the most specials in a Splatoon game by far, and the game isn't even out. 
Splatoon 1 only had 7 specials. Splatoon 2 had 9 for a long time until Booyah Bomb and Ultra Stamp were added, boosting it to 11. And Splatoon 3 already has 15, with possibly more on the way in future updates. The weapon variety will definitely get a boost, as most weapons will have a different special from one another, but this could mean that weapons have a higher chance of getting stuck with a bad kit than ever before. We will see how it shakes out though. Another thing of note from this segment is that this is the gold arrow spray making its appearance, which is the first variant of the main weapon that we've seen, possibly pointing to Splatoon 3's launch with two variants of each weapon. Quick math would be two variants of each of the 50 returning main weapon types from Splatoon 1 and 2, and the Splatana Wiper and Tri-Stringer, if they had two variants as well, would be 104 weapons total at launch. That's pretty solid if you ask me. Next up we get a look at some of the weapon icons and kits, confirming that Torpedo has returned. And of note is that the Splatana Wiper actually does the same damage as, Splat as Splat Dooleys at 30 each slash, but a greater range than the Splat Dooleys and the Splatbrella. I do wonder if the charge slash scales with distance though, or is it only 60 at range and 120 up close? We'll have to wait and see on that. Back in Splatsville, we step into Ammo Knights and see our good old friend, Sheldon. And he's got some news. You now have to purchase weapons with Sheldon licenses instead of coins. His store also has a ton of little details in the background. He's got dynamo rollers, goo tubers, e-leaders, and the handles of carbon rollers hanging from the ceiling. He's got curling bombs lined up on the ceiling as well. He's got boxes of weapon parts, tanks from splatlings, nozzles from splatlings, parts of stringers, maybe even parts of stringers we haven't seen yet, screwdrivers and wrenches hanging on the wall, as well as this like bike tire air pump the actual roller part of the carbon roller and splat and suction bombs on the floor including one that he's seemingly just deconstructing in the middle of the shop Sheldon seems like he's more organized than ever and experimenting like usual we also get a quick look at part of an animation for testing a weapon right here as well as another animation of an inkling testing a weapon right here as it mimics using the bucket this is one of my favorite small touches from Splatoon and Splatoon 2, and I'm glad to see that they return in Splatoon 3. But back to the Sheldon's licenses, which are obtained by leveling up through battling and using weapons consistently. We see on this screen a nice user interface where it displays a stage, your name, your medals won in a battle, and your weapon and your gear. The medals are super exciting as they are essentially in-game achievements and bonuses. Quick Respawn is back too, and we see that you get a bonus for winning a match for the first time on a new day, and this counts towards your catalog level, something that we'll also cover a little bit later. We can see that using your weapon consistently raises its freshness up to 5 stars. Freshness gives you Sheldon's licenses, and what's not mentioned in direct is that it can also unlock ornamental armaments for your locker, which we'll also discuss those later on too. Now, one Sheldon's license can be exchanged for one weapon that corresponds to your current level, but you can also use extra Sheldon's licenses to purchase weapons above your level, which is really nice if you want something that unlocks at a higher level. I like this change a lot as it incentivizes people to use new weapons to gain more licenses so you can unlock new weapons, but it does cut down on having stuff to spend coins on, which is a major complaint I have with Splatoon 1 and 2. Once you buy everything in those games, coins are essentially worthless except for re-rolling gear, but you'll have plenty to spend your coins on and we'll see that later, don't worry. We do get a shot of the area outside the battle tower again, and you can see some boba tea right here, so that's a thing in these games, I guess. We don't get a great glimpse of that blue orb statue from earlier, but we see it again, and it actually has two orbs. We also watch some Inklings play rock, paper, scissors, which if you didn't know, is foreshadowing for later. We see some Inklings gossiping and a glimpse of some studio lights in the background? I love this subtle foreshadowing and dope animations, and I only caught these by re-watching the direct a few times. For fashion, we have this inkling with a manatee on her shirt, which is super cute. We also get a glimpse of these inklings sitting on a fire escape. We do get to see the three gear shops next to Sheldon's Ammo Knights on the main street, but before entering the shops, the little buddy from Hero Mode seems to be bouncing on a stool outside this middle shop here. I wonder if he follows the player around in the hub. 
Also, the button for the stoplight crossing the street is in the shape of a squid, which is another cool touch. The shop layout looks like it's the clothing building, then the headgear building, and then the shoes building, but the actual menu layout is headgear, then clothing, then shoes. This isn't really that much of a detail, but I thought it was a little bit confusing. Now we get to jump into the shops. We start in Nought Couture, the headgear shop run by Gnarly Eddie the Nautilus and Nails the Snail, who himself even has a little tiny hat. This shop has a rustic, almost savannah-like decor with hats all about. These two sell headgear and keep up the theme of the headgear salesperson always having a small, loud little friend, like Mo the Clownfish in Splatoon 1 and Crayman the Crayfish in Splatoon 2. Tenacity shows its face as an ability, as does one of the new brands in the game, Embers. We also do get a split second shot of a new ability called Sub Resistance Up, which does reduce the effects and damage from sub weapons. This is actually replacing Bomb Defense DX, and I'll mention it in a bit. Next door is Man O Wardrobe, and its shopkeeper Gel Lafleur. He keeps the tradition of the clothing shopkeeper being a jelly who speaks inkling but not perfectly. His design and the name of the shop are obviously references to the Portuguese Man o' War, which is often confused for a jellyfish but is actually a siphonophore. And instead of giving you a bio marine biology lesson on what a siphonophore actually is, I'll just focus on the shop. He has a squeaky clean stainless steel aesthetic and a wonderful Hawaiian shirt in this glass case for some reason. We do get to see a special emblem on this shirt down here which isn't explained in the direct but it is on the website. Basically if you find a duplicate of your current gear you can buy it to increase your, your current gear star power past 3 stars which makes it gain more experience meaning you'll be able to grind chunks easier. You can also try on outfits by pressing the right stick, which makes your inkling do more unique animations. Next up is the shoe shop Crush Station and its shopkeeper, Mr. Coco. The name of the shop and Mr. Coco himself are puns on Crush Station. Crush Station. Haha, -ha, get it? The class of animals that Mr. Coco is. And he is a coconut crab, one of the largest crustaceans in the world, which does explain why he's so big. And you probably guessed it, he keeps the theme of the shoe shopkeeper always being a crustacean with multiple pairs of legs that have shoes on them. His shop has various shoes in the back, a leather chair, and it kind of feels like a cozy diner or like a speakeasy. Next up we'll jump into abilities with a small comparison of run speed shown here which seems like it's much more effective in this game but we don't actually know how much run speed this inkling has on it so who knows if it's really more effective or not only testing will show when the game comes out. But we do get a look at another new ability intensify action. I've mentioned this before but this ability improves squid surge and squid roll making squid surge literally instantaneous. The Splatoon 3 website offers an even better explanation of the new two abilities. Intensify action will allow you to keep more momentum while you're using multiple squid rolls and charges up squid surge faster, which we've seen. It also lessens the RNG in your accuracy when you fire a weapon after using these two maneuvers. Sub resistance up lessens the effects and damage of sub weapons that are used on you like taking less damage from bombs and sprinklers being marked for less time and resisting the effects of toxic mist confirming that toxic mist is back as well these two abilities are essentially replacing bomb defense up dx which itself was a combination of bomb defense and cold blooded and main power up to me these are great changes main power up and ability was just poorly designed it either made a weapon really great or didn't do anything super meaningful and bomb defense up dx is essentially now just made a better more well-rounded version of itself with sub resistance up and before we get to arguably one of the best parts of this direct we'll see we see a small back alley next to the shoal which i have added to our map from earlier but now to the big stuff Merch is back, baby, and he's older, he's wearing jeans, and he's much taller. 
This begs the question of how much time has passed since Splatoon 2, and honestly we have no concrete confirmation as of the release of this video, but I think it's safe to say that it's probably been at least 4-5 to five years. Now, I love Merch's new design, and I love seeing a returning character get a whole new look in the series. He still plays on his phone like before, and can stop on a dime and help any Inkling or Octoling with their gear needs. Now, the gear system itself has also changed a little bit. Merch's menu now has a much cleaner user interface and more options. Obviously you have your order status from Squiz in the Plaza and your Splatnet orders, as well as the ability to scrub gear and re-roll, and re-rolling sadly seems to only still take Super Sea Snails, but adding abilities has changed a little bit, and increasing your star power on gear is a completely new option. You can now change the main ability of the gear as well as the subs. It does take 45 gear chunks to do so, but you get 6 chunks of the, of the ability that you're replacing in return, so it's not a complete waste. In terms of the gear system, the website has even more information, of course. Mainly just that you can increase your star power on any piece of gear to up it to 5 stars at max, which makes them gain much more experience. The website also informs us that even if your gear has full subs, it will continue to net you chunks when you play, meaning that chunk grinding is going to be so much easier in this game. These are all great quality of life changes, and combined with changing the main ability allows the perfect gear to be that much closer to get. We've come a long way from Spike and his random rolls in Splatoon 1. Although what isn't shown is if the chunks needed to add subs has changed at all, and I wouldn't be surprised if they stay the same, but I'll keep an eye out if it changes. Another wonderful quality of life change, no longer locked behind Amiibo, is that you can save your favorite gear combinations and controller settings as freshest fits, so you can swap between them at any time. This is fantastic, especially if you use different weapons and have specific builds for them and you want to change on the fly. We also see here that Opening Gambit, Haunt, and Respawn Punisher are back. We'll again have to see if they've changed at all, but opening Gambit has a square emblem, which is a small change at least. And with your freshest fits, they also save your motion and stick sensitivity, which is really nice, because some people like to have different sensitivities for different weapons that they use. Now jumping into the lobby, we get a closer look at that 3 I spotted earlier. As we walk up to the lobby, we can see on the sign that the lobby has multiple floors, these oblong jellies are back, and some inklings are on their sea cucumber phones. The interior of the lobby kind of looks like a YouTube diamond play button to me. Now the lobby menu has gotten a complete overhaul, with 3D elements, a sick neon sign effect, and way easier navigation. You can access the lobby by entering the tower or pressing the L button. Turf battles are the same as usual, but rank battles are now called anarchy battles, and they have two different versions. Our first look is at the anarchy battle series version which you can play solo ranked and you have to win either 5 games or lose 3 to gain or lose points. Gaining points puts you over thresholds and then you can rank up. The website goes into much more detail here though. You do need to sacrifice some rank points that are compatible with your own rank as a fee to play. You'll pay up in points and then match with teammates of similar ranks and skill levels. Your, your opponent's teams are not only based on your rank, but also the number of wins you have in your current challenge. After battle, you can choose to stick with your current team or pause the challenge and come back later. The challenge will continue until you've won five times or lost three times. Then your rank points will be doled out, and you'll get more rank points the more you win. So, if you win four, but you lose three, the challenge will end, but you'll still gain points. Obtaining medals is also another way to get some rank points too. Obviously higher ranks require way more points to enter a challenge, but they provide greater point rewards. This system is a extremely welcome change. And it may seem confusing, but its strengths are that it requires you to win more than you lose to rank up, and at least perform well in matches and get medals to at least salvage bosses meaning perpetually bad players or unskilled players will not rank up as easily as in previous games. Of course, even if you carry your team and lose, you can still get points from medals, meaning that you should always try hard and that losing isn't a complete loss like in the past. Being the best painter or best splatter in the lobby and still losing won't be a death sentence, and that's fantastic for players who thrive in support roles or just can't solo carry a team but they still contribute a lot. 
We do get a sneak peek of the zones layout on Hagglefish Market, and we see it's as one zone map, and that Splat Zones does not change as a game mode. Tower Control is back, and with its checkpoint system from Splatoon 2, we can see that Undertow Spillway has two checkpoints, and that the game shows who's in the lead with this simple lead graphic. Now, Rainmaker is back, but with a huge change. Gone are the days of losing a Rainmaker match in under 30 seconds. Welcome to a new age. Rainmaker now has checkpoints, like Tower Control. You have to dunk the Rainmaker on a checkpoint podium before you can go and dunk it on the real final podium. This is a fantastic change. As it balances the mode, it makes those quick KOs that result from just one mistake completely go away, and it allows players to be smarter and more calculated with their pushes. I expect KOs in this mode to be a little more rare than before, but I do think Rainmaker will kind of suffer in high level competitive, as now players are kind of incentivized to be much slower, stall for long periods of time, and just defend a checkpoint or two instead of having to always be aware of where the Rainmaker is. However, as shown on Undertow Spillway later in the direct, two checkpoints are present, and once the Rainmaker is dunked on one of them, you can proceed to the final checkpoint meaning players have multiple options to choose from on certain maps, and this will help mitigate what I mentioned above about stalling and camping checkpoints. Another change is that dunking a Rainmaker on a checkpoint makes it respawn on the checkpoint, while you get to regain control of your main weapon. This is really nice for players who tend to slay first and try to carry a lobby, but need to move objective too. You can pick up the Rainmaker, dunk it on a checkpoint, and then get back to splatting, which is really nice. Also, if dunking on a checkpoint makes you drop it, what if the game's in overtime? Do you still technically have control? I mean, you essentially give the enemy team a really, really easy way to stop you. If you, get, if you have to get through a checkpoint, they can just let you dunk it, then win the pop and grab it back. Either, either way, it's a very interesting change with some net positives and maybe a few negatives. Also, the Rainmaker itself, when held, replaces your special and your main weapon icons, allowing people to know who has the Rainmaker. This is really great, as a lot of the time it can be hard to tell who actually is carrying the Rainmaker, and if you should be worried about them. Like, did the charger on the enemy team grab it? If they did, then we can push up and not be afraid to be sniped, but if they didn't grab it, we have to be careful. All that type of worry is gone now, all you have to do is look up, see who has it, and play on. Next up is Clan Blitz, which had some minor changes that I think are all relatively positive. First is that a Power Clam now only takes 8 clams to make instead of 10. This obviously makes them much easier to make, but it also makes scoring much more efficient and allows players to solo carry a lobby just a little bit easier. The Power Clam still counts for 20 points, so getting 8 is now the easiest way to score since if you threw 7 in individually, it'd only be 21. This will make Clan Blitz faster, kind of less of a slog, and much easier to play. I don't know how many times I've wasted games away just scrambling to grab 10 clams spread all over the map so I can get a power clam to open the basket in time. Another small but great change that's going to help that is that you can now see how many clams your teammates have at any time. All you have to do is look at their weapon icons where these little clams pile up. This is great because you know if you're even close to making a power clam, or if your entire team is loaded to the teeth with clams and are ready to just score. Anyway, back to the battle system. Stage rotations are back, two maps at a time. I know this is kind of controversial, but I'll save the topic of stage rotations for another video. Another note is that Turf, Anarchy Battle Series, and Anarchy Battle Open all have different rotations. And with the eventual inclusion of League Battle and X Battle, this game could have four to five rotations at a time, meaning that possibly every mode in the game could be playable at any time, which, now that I'm thinking about it, is actually kind of awesome. But let's focus on the next version of Anarchy Battle, Anarchy Battle Open, where you can play solo or team up with up to three friends to play rank modes online. The website gives a lot more information on the Anarchy Battles, so let's take a little detour to see all that. Anarchy Battle Open allows you to play with up to three of your friends. If there are fewer than four players in your group, then random players will be selected to round out your squad. 
Your group will be matched up with teammates with similar skill levels to the player with the fewest ranked points in the group. You'll also face an opposing team with a similar skill level to your own team to obviously keep it fair and fun. You get to choose how you want to earn and spend points in Anarchy Battle Series or Anarchy Battle Open, and each type of Anarchy Battle, like I said before, will have a different active mode for added variety. Also, the rank points in Splatsville will increase or decrease based on wins and losses. They are not tied to a specific mode, so play hard and earn points while your favorites are active. Which essentially means you don't have to get S plus 50 in all four modes anymore. The rank themselves go from C minus to C, C plus, B minus, B, B plus, A minus, A, A plus, S, and then S plus zero, which can go all the way up to S plus 50. And when you're on the cusp of ranking up, you can do a rank up battle. If you win the match, you rank up. For example, from C plus to B minus. You do need to put some rank points on the line to enter the challenge of a rank up battle so they can only be done in the Anarchy Battle series, meaning to rank up, you've got to do it alone. You don't have any of your friends to help you. And a rank up battle, you have to battle together with players in the rank you're aspiring to be in. So if you're a C- and you want to rank up to B-, you're going to have to play this rank up battle with B-. minuses. But... On the bright side, you only have to get three wins before three losses to successfully rank up instead of the five wins that you usually have to get. Now, losing does not cost you your rank, just a little bit of points, and you can retry again when you get backed up to the point threshold. Now, once you get a new rank, it won't go down as you play like it did in the past. However, all ranks will go down slightly every three months for each new season. This is calculated by looking at the highest rank you have reached up to the point of the new season. In theory, a rank will drop by 2 from the highest rank you've achieved. So people that are from S plus 0 to S plus 9 will actually drop down to S, and anyone above that will just revert to S plus 0. So if you're above S plus 9, you're good to go when the rank resets come around. However, the method of adjusting these ranks may change in future updates. This is a bit odd, but it also makes sure that no one is perpetually at the top, just consistently at S plus 50, and that they all start on a level, a level playing field each season. Well, at least a level playing field at their rank. Now, when X rank comes out, that might be a different story, though. Other than X battles, which we'll cover in a little bit, the game does have private battles as usual, with a recon mode, they and the ability to have two spectators like in Splatoon 2. Replays are saved for private battles as well, but we'll cover replays in a little while too. Now we get to see the features in the lobby itself. The lobby menu has five icons on the top, first probably being battle, second being the stat sheet, third an envelope, possibly meaning invites. The fourth icon is like two squids, which maybe means playing with friends or something. And the fifth is a testing dummy. So now, instead of having to go to ammo nights or through the weapons menu to access the testing range, you can just go straight to the lobby to do it. And if you didn't notice, you're actually standing in the all new testing range this whole time, which features a huge screen, which what I think is the map rotations behind you. The testing range itself has a bunch of dummies at different heights, ramps, and small and large dummies to test on, including moving ones and a new special dummy that attacks you. This dummy is described on the website as a state-of-the-art copy machine that allows you to practice defensive maneuvers, and I'm pretty sure this is what they're referring to. We can also see the fully charged tri-stringer shot deals 105 damage, and the splatter shot deals 36, so it's still, uh, it's still a three shot, of course. The tri-stringer has a cool triple shot reticle that shows the three dots merging into one when it's fully charged, and you can finally, finally, use the testing range while waiting for matches. Now, next up is ghosts of your friends, or teammates that appear when they are online or when you're queuing for a match. You can watch the ghosts practice in the training room or just party with them as they're holograms and they don't have any effect on you. And you can even join their lobbies or decide to team up and play some matches. 
There are two methods for joining ghosts or your friends in general. You can create a group and invite them or join a group, or you can drop in on a friend that's currently playing. The group method allows you and your friends to play on the same team, while dropping in on a friend doesn't guarantee you'll be on the same team. According to the official website, in a future update, a notification channel will be added that allows you to use a general keyword like hashtag turf war squids or hashtag splat zone fans to connect to a channel. This is probably what that double squid icon on the lobby menu is probably referring to. This way you'll be able to interact with ghosts of players who are using the same keyword. If many participants are in that channel though, you may not be able to interact with all of their ghosts. Now, these are great quality of life updates that make playing with your friends so much easier than before. We also see Judd sleeping in the testing range area with his bowl, and I wonder what happens if you try to splat him. Also, nowhere in the direct or associated materials that I could find does it say whether you still get super sea snails for leveling up, but I know you got them from Judd in Splatoon 2, that's why I mention it now, but back to the analysis. The Splatana Wiper deals 30 damage, of course, and the Charge Slash from medium distance does 60 and 100 damage and 120 damage at close range. We do get to see the reticle for this weapon, which is unique. It has three lines on either side of the main circle that fill up, turn orange, and turn vertical when your Charge Slash is ready. The terminal in the lobby allows you to get stuff, view your replays, see battle stats, look up replay codes, edit your splash tag, change your name, and check your Splatfest region. There is also seemingly a space for an 8th option on this terminal, which I anticipate will have something to do with X rank and its monthly rankings once that's available in a future update. But back to replays, you can view any replay for any of your last 50 battles, and according to the website, you can upload them to the cloud and share them with a code. This is huge for Splatoon, as it allows anyone to review their play and see what mistakes they make and how they can improve, as well as capturing all of the funny moments and sick kill streaks you get without having to worry if it fits in the 30 second clip window of the Switch's camera capture function. This is also really big for content creators, streamers, and tournaments, as it's easier than ever to have high-level matches or just content in general be viewable by anyone, even if you do not have a capture card. The replay itself shows some commands on the side for pausing, a camera, and a navigation bar, which allow you to pause, fast-forward, and highlight specific portions of a replay. Also, when you fast forward, you temporarily see this opaque 3 as well. You can also view anyone's point of view in a match at any time, and while swapping it briefly, shows their special gauge amounts like in spectator mode, which is gigantic for competitive Splatoon. We can now see every person's point of view in huge matches and really big moments, as well as the ability to verify disconnects in tournament settings or if anybody's cheating. This feature is really understated, but absolutely monumental going forward. The ability to share replays is also huge, as it allows people who may not have the capacity to edit video or capture their gameplay to send it to someone who can. This also gives us a look at results for a match, which shows weapons, names, paint, splats, death, special, the time and the date, the map, the mode, and the type of battle it was. This is such an amazing feature and I'm ecstatic it's present in Splatoon 3. A small snag though is that obviously your console's memory is limited and it can only hold a certain number of replays and similar to Super Smash Bros, future updates may make your old replays completely inaccessible, but as long as you share them before an update happens, you're good to go. On a negative note though, it's now easier than ever to shame newbies or players who just aren't as good at you at the game since you can watch their point of view in a replay. I doubt there'll be an overwhelming amount of people engaging in harassment of people by sharing replays of them underperforming, but it's definitely a possibility. So as a rule of thumb, don't be mean to new players. They're the lifeblood of success for any game. And just 
treat people with respect and also be aware that you could be on the receiving end of getting shamed if you do something that somebody doesn't like in a match, like squid bagging. They can now capture it and share it too. Next up, we get to see the inside of the testing range lobby area's other side. The elevator and the terminal sit on the left, and a staircase behind them leads up to an area that has some tables. They might be some sort of tabletop gaming cabinets that contain squid beats and squid jump and squid racer, but I don't really think so. In front of the inkling itself in this shot is glass doors that hold the locker room, which we will touch on very shortly, but look at this gumball machine just to the right. They don't mention what this thing is, but the website does, and I just love the look of this thing. I think it's funny that they put a gigantic oversized gumball machine in the lobby, and that's just hilarious to me. Also, another one of these species that the overall guys is, and I think he sells food tickets and stuff. You can also see a jelly with headphones jumping in the window above him. The locker room is next up, and as you can see, there are six lockers on the left and 14 in front of us. The first eight are obviously all the players from your last match, but I don't know what the other 12 lockers in here are for. Perhaps they're just random ones or just people you've played with in the past. There's also some seating, a soda machine, and some space we can't see off to the right. It's really unknown how big this locker room is. But the lockers themselves are fully customizable units that anyone who plays against you can see. And they have a barrage of stuff to put in it. Finally, a use for all those excess coins. Now, looking at these lockers, you can customize a lot. The menu that briefly flashes here shows eight different tabs. To me, they seem like items, posters and stickers, weapons, headgear, clothing, shoes, hooks, slash shelves, and paint. So there's a lot to swap around to make it your own. In terms of the items we see, well, there's a lot. The first locker itself has some manga, a hat, jersey, shoes, a skateboard, a keychain, and a can of spam, I guess? The second locker features five shirts, three shoe boxes, two pairs of shoes, a hat, and a Mr. Shrug figure. The third contains two shirts, a pair of shoes, a long rainbow squid plush, a folded up splash wall, and a poster for the Splatoon 2 band Chirpy Chips. The fourth locker has two small black test dummies flanking this poster for the Splatoon 1 band, High Tide Era. It also has a shirt, headphones, glasses, and a large speaker at the bottom. The fifth locker has two shirts, a pair of shoes, two bags of snacks, a drink can, a shovel, and a stack of newspapers. The sixth locker, which is shown being customized, has a tent umbrella, the Spawn Espresso Machine Drone Thing, three drink cans, a suction bomb, a mug, and even some smaller cans in it. The next one is just the first one again, but with the skateboard being added to it and customized. Now, the customization controls of the locker allow you to turn, rotate, flip, zoom, and organize things in the exact way you want them to look, as well as having some gravity and interaction with the environment, as when they put the skateboard down, it flops over. The outside stickers and posters of a lot of these lockers are of popular graffiti found in the game, which makes me super excited. I love this graffiti, and being able to kind of collect it is so sick. Now, the seventh locker shown has six shirts, two shoes and boxes, two mugs, and some different shelving, so that's probably what's controlled under that hook tab we saw in the menu. The eighth locker has this wood pallet, a plastic crate, a goo tuber, two of these skipjack tuna with hats, which is a reference to some of the graffiti in the game. It has some clams from Clam Blitz in a little bucket, a container of salmon power eggs from Hero Mode, and a styrofoam cooler, probably from the mothership in Salmon Run. The ninth locker has a hat, two shirts, shoes, a mug, a sea cucumber phone, some books and manga, two collectible figures, and some snack bags. So, a pretty typical locker here, actually. The tenth has a stack of newspapers, three pairs of glasses, two shirts, a hat, and quite a few books. 
which is probably a studious inkling. The 11th locker is packed full of shoes and shoe boxes, obviously a sneakerhead. And the 12th locker has a wood pallet again, two shoe boxes, a pair of shoes, three shirts, an umbrella, a pair of glasses, a mug, five books, and what seems to be a trophy of some sorts. This actually made me think that the winners of any Nintendo-hosted tournaments could get a unique piece of gear that they could put in their lockers which is super sick if they actually do that i kind of hope they do because that would be incredible that would be such a flex if you had a trophy that only let's say four people in the world had now anyway there's also a promotional image that shows i guess a 13th locker with a fully 3d rendered mr shrug which i have never seen in 3d before which looks actually really really nice there's also a stringer, a splatter shot, one of the test dummies again, the cardboard box with the I Ship It logo, which is present a lot in Splatoon 1 and 2, and their graffiti, especially in maps like Walleye Warehouse and Sturgeon Shipyard. There's also tons of graffiti stickers all over this locker, a shirt, shoes, two little Squid Plus keychains, and three green figurines of a Drizzler, a Chum, and a Quahawk from Salmon Run. So maybe defeating certain amounts of those enemies will unlock figurines and other locker items, which is kind of a cool thing to think about. But you might be saying, well, where do you get these items from? And well, you get them at Hotlantis. Enter the store and whoa, there is a lot in here. But let's take a look at the shopkeeper first. Her name is Harmony, and she's actually the lead vocalist for the band The Chirpy Chips, who made songs that are featured in Splatoon 1 and 2 and probably 3. And this is actually the first time we've ever seen a band member in-game, other than Off the Hook and Squid Sisters, of course. This is awesome, as a lot of the bands and their members are unknown to Western audiences, as their information was only published in a Japanese-only art book featured in Octo Expansion called Haikara Walker. Thanks to Rasikus for the translation of, of Harmony's bio, as we know that Harmony is a sea anemone, like Annie, the headgear shopkeeper in Splatoon 1, who is now the Splatnet shop owner in 2 and 3, and Harmony, like Annie, has a clownfish in her hair, but hers is black because it's actually dying of neglect. Yeesh. Now Harmony is holding and playing with an Easter egg of sorts here, the Nintendo Ultra Hand. This was a toy made by Nintendo in the 1960s and is actually one of their more well-known toys from when they actually made toys. It actually had a WiiWare game that was exclusive to Club Nintendo members and came with an Ultra Hand peripheral as well. Just a cool little Easter egg that they added in here. Now the background itself is full of Splatoon items, like the fresh fish headgear that was an amiibo exclusive to the Octoling Octopus amiibo in Splatoon 2. You've got another example of a Mr. Shrug figurine again, this tabletop arcade machine in the middle of the room, as well as a plush based on one of Krusty Sean's dishes from Splatoon 2 hanging from the ceiling, the skipjack tuna with the hat from the graffiti here, and these squid plushes that resemble the ones that you can get in real life, including as a pre-order bonus from Walmart for Splatoon 3. I love all this stuff, and I'll be collecting as much of it, hopefully all of it, in-game as possible. We can also see various stickers and posters for sale, as well as books and magazines and figurines, including the Salmon Manners handbook, which also shows that you can buy multiple of any item. I wonder how much you can own. I don't know if it caps at 3 or 5 or 9, or if you can just have infinite amounts of every item, but we'll see when the game comes out. I absolutely adore all this customization and collection as it really fleshes out the game it gives you more stuff to do and buy and it also makes every player's experience even more unique everybody at launch is going to be able to get different items and different things to buy and we're all going to have unique lockers we can show off it's, i just can't i can't wait now branching off that we actually get to the customization section of the direct where we get introduced to splash tags, which we've seen in previous trailers, but we get a little bit more of an in-depth dive now. Splash tags are composed of three different things, a banner, badges, and a title. 
Splash tags actually require you to pick a nickname when you register it. This is different from your user nickname on the Nintendo Switch, which is like the name of your Nintendo Switch profile. And this nickname will only be used in Splatoon 3. Your nickname can be updated, but you have to wait a little bit before changing it again. You also get a unique ID number that will help identify you to other players because if you have the same nickname as somebody, your ID number will be different. And changing your nickname will, of course, change the ID number. So if you get a good ID number, like, I don't know, 6969, and you want to change your nickname, say goodbye to that precious number. Now, all of the customizable elements of the splash tag can be bought or unlocked through the catalog, meaning my hope for in-game achievements that I wanted in a previous video has been fulfilled! Now, the banners can be obtained via the catalog or from the shell out machine in the lobby, which is that big gumball machine we were talking about earlier. Some of these banners actually feature art from the game's graffiti, some from promotional image, some have brand logos, some just have random patterns, and some actually include weapon icons, like this one right here that shows off the chainsaw looking Splatana weapon, which I'll touch on much later by the way. We also get a quick look at the badges in the game, which show that you can at least get one for having four and five stars on a weapon, but there's also some for brand logos and specials. Meeting other certain requirements like getting 50 regular battle wins and earning 10,000 Grizzco points will also earn you more badges, so who knows how many of these things there are, how you unlock all of them, and what they all look like. I'm really pumped thinking about all the rare badges that you can get with super super crazy unlock requirements, maybe you have to reach like a super high rank or a super high X power or maybe you have to win like a thousand battles or get like a million ink and you get super cool badges, I, I just can't wait to dive into this. Now the final component of splash tags are the titles and they require you to mix and match two words or phrases to create this unique title for yourself. They are also available from the catalog and the big shell out machine in the lobby. Now aside from special titles, each player will get titles in a different order so expect a ton of different variety. You can also change your emotes in this game. We only see five emotes here, but I expect a ton more to be unlocked or purchasable. We actually see a sixth emote, which is dabbing in the catalog a little bit later on. And the names of these two that we see are Lowdown and Stuntin'. So I'm really excited. I feel like they could add a lot of crazy and wacky stuff, kind of like Fortnite emotes in here, but I think that's just another element of customization that is super nice to have in Splatoon. Now, back in Harmony's shop, we, we see the shovel from earlier, which is buying. We see a poster for a Splatoon 2 band, Turquoise October. And we also see one of those large black blocks that are used in multiplayer modes that you can buy like you can buy level geometry as items here like what you can also get a ton of different items via the in-game catalog of which you get a new one every three months meaning constant new stuff to unlock and use catalogs themselves are leveled up by experience you gain through battles and job shifts at grizzco you can also earn catalog points via achievements like getting your first win or doing your first job shift of the day like we saw earlier in the direct on the pay on the catalog page here we get to see that dabbing emote i was talking about a piece of headgear a locker item a banner and some food tickets so i'm thinking there are unlocks per page and that you have you know maybe a set amount of pages per catalog i don't know if there's 10 or 20 or 50. there's also some inkling script on these pages and I tried to translate it but it's seemingly gibberish as well. The catalog unlocks seasonal gear according to the narrator and it'll be released until at least 2024 which is dope. That is a ton of potential content and I cannot wait to unlock it all. Next up is kind of a different turn as we're introduced to Table Turf Battle which is an in-game card-based version of Turf War. Now, I love the art style of these cards and also, again, the collectible aspect. 
I feel like this is such a dope minigame that has way more depth than Squid Jump or Squid Beats ever had. And we also see that each card has a number corresponding to the amount of spaces it covers and a color that denotes it's a special. Now obviously like regular Turf War you want to have the most squares covered at the end and it's at least 10 or 11 turns long. I don't know how many, maybe it's 15, maybe it's 20, maybe there are different modes where you can play 30 turns, I don't know. You also have an option to turn your special on or off and to pass. You can charge power and unleash special attacks, and specials will probably have different effects, but they don't really explain any of the rules in this direct, and there is nothing about it online. But the goal is relatively easy to understand. There's over 150 cards to collect, and I kind of expect that number to increase as they either throw them in catalogs or just release them in future updates. Cards also have a rarity value. You can see that these two are common and they have like one star associated with them. And I do really like this deck building. I think it's different and it's cool and it has a ton of different depth. And I can see kind of a niche community within Splatoon's community developing around this. You actually do have a rank in this minigame, and you can even battle shopkeepers and locals like Sheldon. This looks super duper fun. And that odd-looking fish that we've seen all over the place is a staff member that helps run it. You do get a starter deck at first, and we can see that it is held behind this brown and black roofed building, which we saw all the way back in the beginning, but I can't quite place where this is on our map. But since there's trash bags on the roof, I don't really think this area of Splatsville is being developed or taken off quite yet. Regardless, I can't wait to play this and destroy absolutely everyone at it. Next up, we see Salmon Run once again back in our helicopter like we did in the Next Wave trailer, and we circle around the map and see the Salmonids' various foods and grilling equipment. This time, it looks like there's a strawberry, a melon, and maybe some bread, but as we see our Inklings blast off, there's even more food like a mango, a kiwi, and some broccoli. This is all in keeping with the Salmonids' lore surrounding cooking and grilling and all that stuff. We do see that Splatana and the Tri-Stringer are in Salmon Run and that the new specials like Wave Breaker, Triple Ink Strike, and Reef Slider are also in the mode. We do see the new bosses that were revealed in the next wave trailer are here, the Fish Stick and the Flipper Flopper, but we also have some even newer boss Salmonids, the first of which is a chum that rides a floating shower head called the Slammin' Lid. That's going to be really confusing to talk about. Oh yeah, that's the boss Salmonid, the Slammin' Lid. Say that five times fast. This boss protects enemies it spawns, but its weakness is relatively easy to see as it slams down when you get within its little range, and then if you avoid it, you can just jump on top of it and splat it. The next boss is the Big Shot, a huge salmonid that's even bigger than a quahawk that puts a metal ball in a machine and then launches it towards players, and when it lands, it sends out shockwaves similar to the Wave Breaker special. This guy's weakness is that he fires relatively slowly and he has to go back to the water every single time he launches a ball also later on in this trailer you can see that the inklings use this machine that he was using to launch golden eggs farther into the map which is pretty sick now a new part of salmon run and the introduction of that big old salmonid that we saw in the next wave trailer is the extra wave which sometimes happens after a successfully completed third wave Basically, a king salmonid strikes, you get this overtime in the form of the extra wave. The goal is to deal as much damage to the king salmonid as possible, and if your team gets wiped out during this, you'll fail the extra wave. But you'll still get credit for successfully completing the three prior waves, and you'll be compensated accordingly. Now, to deal more damage to this king salmonid, in this case, it's now revealed that its name is Kohozuna, which is actually a pun on Kohawk, which is a type of salmon, and a Yokozuna, the highest ranking in sumo wrestling, you can use your secret new weapon, the Egg Cannon. Now, when the extra wave starts, you'll get the Egg Cannon to fire back at the King Salmonid. You need to get your hands on golden eggs and then press A for a whale size smackdown. The extra wave is a fight for survival, so there is no egg basket in this wave. Those golden eggs are purely for offense, so grab them and fire them at the King Salmonid. This is an all-out battle to the death, just trying to kill the big baddie, and I love it. I think it makes Salmon Run so much more fun and interesting, and it'll be really intense when it happens. 
And I've always wanted sort of like a huge kind of, I guess you could say, raid boss to slay. And this kind of fits the bill. You only have about 90 seconds to do it. But that makes it even more intense. And not mentioned in the direct, but on the official website, is that if you make it to the extra wave and damage the King Salmonid, you get a special reward card, Fish Scales. There are three types of fish scales, and the rarer varieties are more likely to drop after a higher hazard level. Now, you can exchange these fish scales for special designs for splash tags or items for lockers, so that's probably how you get the figurines of the Salmonid enemies. Or you can also exchange them for an alternate work outfit that's still Grisco approved, of course. There's also a new mode in Salmon Run called the Big Run, which only takes place every few months, probably when the season starts, ranks reset, weapons come out, and the catalogs release, that shows Salmon Runs invading the areas where Inklings live. This time, it's shown as Salmon is invading Wahoo World. I really kind of hope this is like an endless mode, uh, or some sort of half-paced, high-score event, because that would make me want to continue to play Salmon Run every single day when it comes out. Now, a few things of note not mentioned in the direct, but on the website about Salmon Run is some lore and updates. Now, during the Squid Research Lab's investigation of some questionable business practices in the Splatlands, they came across Grisco Industries hidden in a Splatsville basement. Grisco has a new building, and this time around, they have a waiting room for workers, where you can prepare for your shift by testing out the weapons of the day against various salmonid dummies or practicing the new egg throw using mock eggs. And, like in the lobby's testing range, you can watch and interact with ghosts of your non-corporeal colleagues. There is also a new pay grade in Salmon Run, as the professional title has been usurped by the Executive VP, providing a shining new rung on the corporate ladder. Your new earning power will increase with a higher title, but the job sites will get more intense as well. They have also incorporated a 333% increase in hazard level at the sites where Executive VPs work. So if you obtain that rank, the salmon run's gonna be a lot harder for you. Salmon Run workers in Splatsville also get Grisco points and re earn reward capsules like in Splatoon 2. You can exchange these capsules for cash and items at the exchange desk. And also as an added employee benefit, you can still gain catalog points in addition to Grisco points for jobs. This way, even people who only play Salmon Run can still increase their catalog level, which is nice. But, most importantly, Salmon Run is no longer limited to certain days. It can be played whenever. Obviously, the weapons and the maps are on a rotation, but you can play it at any time. Finally. I remember when Splatoon 2 launched and I wanted to play Salmon Run so bad, but it, it, it only came out a few days afterwards, and it was only open for a few days, and then you would just have periods of time where you just can't play it at all and i always thought that was really stupid and now they've finally gotten rid of it so thank the heavens next up we finally get confirmation that the manhole we were looking at earlier is indeed the way to get to hero mode and once again houses captain cuttlefish under this shrine gate we still don't really get a good look at that blue orb statue maybe we will one day Captain cuttlefish doesn't have his trademark hat though and is now rocking a hawaiian shirt in the new Octarians area, we see these large triangular screens that they use to mimic the sky, and we're on this land that's covered in snow in the fuzzy ink we saw in the Return of the Mammalians trailer. In the distance is this rocket shuttle, this landing vessel, these Moai statues, and Callie, Marie, and Agent 4 waiting for us with a zapfish nearby. We do get a close-up of the captain, this shot of Agent 3 with the little buddy, and some wild, like, tube-looking things in the background, and then some warped wooden structures. It seems the backgrounds for these levels are not in the same place, so maybe we travel a bit in this story mode this time around. We do get to see Callie and Marie rocking a variation of their classic designs, this time in black, white, and gold, and the old Agent 3 is now wearing the legendary cap, hero headset, and some sort of hero flip-flops. We also get to know that our agent this time is also called Agent 3, so now there's two Agent 3s, but one of them is a Captain, so I guess it's Captain 3, I, I don't know. 
We then see some furry Octarians and get this shot straight out of like Inception or like into the Spider-Verse. I have a feeling gravity mechanics or like mirrors and levels are going to be in this hero mode. But this shot of the two like cityscapes upside down from each other is gorgeous. We also do see a Zapfish light up, meaning that the Octarians are once again stealing these bad boys for power. We also get a quick glimpse of the hero mode HUD. The little buddy actually has a command on the D-pad, and I think it's probably to like call him over, or like activate whatever he does. Now the top right does display the little buddy next to the hero shot, and a special resembling splashdown is shown too, which I assume is just a hero mode only special since it wasn't shown off in the multiplayer sections. As we see in the next clip with the blaster, the little buddy actually takes the place of the sub weapon in hero mode, at least for some levels, as the burst bomb is in the same sub slot here. This also confirms that hero mode will feature different weapons once again, and possibly have the 1000 completion like in previous games where you have to beat every single level using every single weapon. The HUD also shows that you still have 3 lives like Splatoon 1 and 2, and the next clip reveals how the little buddy is going to be used. If we slow it down a bit, look at what, or rather, who is thrown here. That's right, you throw the little buddy! You throw him kind of like a bomb, and he seemingly sticks, jumps, and slams on this device that turns the platforms. Later on, he also slams on the, those large ink balloons that swell and blow up when they take enough damage. So it seems like the little buddy is going to be aiding you in, in getting through levels. You can also see the Inkling lacks a main weapon in this clip, both in their hands and by the symbol next to the little buddy, meaning that there might be levels where you have to beat it just using the little buddy and i think that's pretty cool the next clip shows some balloons that the inkling can shoot and some that re might result in failure as well as a goal that looks like the goals from octo expansion those are the ones that you had to shoot until the barrier broke and all those pieces like assembled so it seems that zapfish and the octo expansion goals are going to be in hero mode which is pretty cool also throughout these levels you can see like Japanese shrine gates like floating in the background as well as like paper lanterns so maybe that's kind of like a main theme here. The next clip shows the octobrush and that same no symbol where the little buddy is meaning that there are probably some levels where you have to beat with no sub and or no little buddy. There is also a timer here so some levels will probably have goals that need to be accomplished in a certain time limit as well. We then get a glimpse of the zip caster in action, a clip of the crab tank fighting off some octo torpedoes, and the background here is of that same cityscape we saw from that uh, epic shot from before, wrapping around in almost a complete circle around this level, as well as those crates that were in octo expansion. We do get a better look at the wooden environment and at the warp cityscape again in the following clip. This little screenshot and clip gives me like huge secret stage and Super Mario Sunshine vibes, but with an added like floating car and there's like bleachers and other random stuff floating around. We then see another element of Octo Expansion, those doors that you entered before you went into a level that sort of like shoot you forward. So maybe the hero mode has you transport around on a subway. Maybe you have like a subway card like you did in Octo Expansion. Also, this is definitely a boss area too. We get shots of the little buddy, Captain Cuttlefish, Callie and Marie, and the old Captain Agent 3, whatever you want to call him, with some shining glowing effect. Maybe they get a new power or something? As well as the classic antagonist of Splatoon's story thus far, DJ Octavio. But this time, he has glasses. The next sequence is pretty wild. There's these large golden and orange fish swim in the air, seemingly above that launch station from earlier. And then Agent 3, the little buddy, and Captain Cuttlefish all tumble down this large tube with tons of fuzzy ink around them as Agent 3's jackets and shoes and other stuff slip off. The narrator says this is the epic finale of the Splattastic saga, maybe hinting that the new Squid Beak Splatoon, Agents 3 and 4, and Callie and Marie will be done after this, and they might finally get rid of DJ Octavio. I doubt this is the end of the series, but the developers probably just want a fresh start with a new story to build off of after this. A short glimpse of Hero Mode for sure in this Direct, but I'm excited to see what the rest of it looks like. Uh, but we did get sort of a blend of like a classic Hero Mode, and there are some elements of Octo Expansion present. So hopefully it's more challenging like Octo Expansion, and more interesting and has more to do. 
After our hero mode sidetrack, the plaza awaits us once again. As we get to see the mailbox and the ability to post drawings like I mentioned at the beginning, some quality of life changes are even coming to this as vertical drawings are now supported, which is pretty cool for every artist or person who just likes posting drawings. Even after seeing this creature multiple times, it's still referred to as just staff. But nonetheless, they're serving up the food and drinks you get from tickets at a store now called Crab and Go. The effects are a 50% boost to coins earned, a 50% boost to experience earned, double the amount of coins earned, and double the amount of experience earned. They are new menu items compared to what Krusty Sean served. They're now seemingly depicting like wraps or like tacos with some crab, shrimp, egg, and even salmon. So now you can kill salmonids on the battlefield and then chow down on their corpses to boost your own money and experience. That's pretty gruesome. There's also these large stacks of food that have emblems with four squids on them. I think these will probably allow you to get the same boost to coins and experience but in multiplayer mode. Uh, maybe applying to all of your teammates at once or something else. These seem to be little cocktail sandwiches and the other is just kind of like a huge mountain of food. I also love the little inkling themed logos that clearly represent MasterCard, Visa, and American Express. That's a pretty nice detail. We don't get a look at the drink menu which is kind of unfortunate because that would probably help us see all of the abilities. But nonetheless, I'm glad to have food and drink back. Now, the shoal allows you to play local multiplayer utilizing a LAN network and has a nice jelly manning the desk and some festive balloons. LAN mode has remained relatively the same. There's nothing here that really screams, we changed it up. Now, Splatoon 3 also now has a photo mode, which is so dope. I've always wanted a photo mode since I've seen all these really cool promotional images that the series has put out over the years and the controls we can see allow you to pan, zoom, tilt, move, and rotate, and I wonder if they'll allow you to use emotes in the photo mode or include filters of some kind. You do have the ability to send these photos to your phone or other smart devices, or you can just put them in your locker like this one next to this toxic mist. The nice thing about this is you don't have to have the UI in a photo now, because typically if you just use the capture function on the switch itself it just takes a picture of the screen but with a built-in photo mode you're getting rid of all the UI around it so your photos just look cleaner and they have a more distinct personality when you take them. Next up is a full recon mode where you can explore any stage at any time. This is an absolute blessing for me and other content creators alike. This allows you to see all the intricacies of any map, practice jumps, shortcuts, and paths. It also allows you to explore and take in the scenery and the sounds, and you can do it for an hour, which is absolutely insane. I love it because you can actually just choose any stage and explore it for an hour. I mean, that's legitimately dope. If there's ever like out of bounds glitches or some crazy shortcut that people discover that you only need that you can do by yourself, you can just practice it whenever you want. And also this will really help new players who maybe you're confused and don't understand layouts of maps. They can go in and literally just walk through it piece by piece and be like, okay, this is, you know, where the spawn is and this is where the mid is and how do I get up here because I know some maps in Splatoon can be confusing for some players they don't understand the grades they don't understand you know how you get certain places so this will definitely help newbies and veterans alike next up is Splatnet 3 which I'm glad is returning Splatnet 2 was good it wasn't great and it seems that Splatnet 3 has made some improvements to this. I mean, just from the UI alone, navigation of Splatnet seems much easier. It seems we have sections for the Splatnet gear shop, your freshest fits, a history tab, the Wander Crust tour, the catalog, photo album, weapon stats, stages, hero mode, a replay viewer, a QR code reader, and the settings, as well as the home tab, stage rotation tab, battles tab, and salmon run tab at the bottom here. Now, the past 50 battle stats this time around 
are similar to Splatnet 2 with some additions. Obviously, you can also view these in the lobby in the main game, which is a great change. But here you have a total win-loss record, your average splats, assists, deaths, and specials. But you also have an additional stat, splats per minute. This is actually a cool stat that kind of shows you how efficient you are, especially when you're playing an aggressive role. It seems the gear shop has a daily drop of three pieces of gear from a specific brand that lasts for eight hours instead of the previous gear drop in Splatnet 2 where it was like six pieces of gear at a time with a new one getting updated every two hours and that piece of gear would last for 10. So that's a kind of a nice change. It consolidates these drops down into one thing. Players can target their favorite brand's gear based on the day and not have to worry about randomly missing a piece and having to scramble to find somebody who ordered it. But honestly, with the option to swap in the main ability for gear, that's kind of a thing of the past now. Krusty Sean's Wander Crust Tour is essentially the ink milestones that are in Splatnet 2, but with a fun twist that incorporates Krusty Sean, who is I guess back in some capacity again. Each new milestone of ink helps him visit new places, and he might give you souvenirs, which I assume are probably just going to be like phone wallpapers. The This actually does kind of fit Krusty Sean's backstory, though, as in the art books, his descriptions both say that he feels something's lacking in his life, and maybe this trip around the world that you get to help him on will help him sort of find it. Now, the history tab displays your all-time highest rank when you started playing the game, your total wins, your badge count, your lifetime turf inked, and your favorite weapons. I like the user interface changes and incorporation of more stats and a better shop system. I think the app itself didn't really need much of a change in its core design as it already was a great complement to the main game. And... We also get to know that the third version will be available at launch, which is pretty nice. Changing gears a bit, we get to Amiibo now, and we see the big Amiibo box is back in the plaza, and it's seemingly in an area we haven't seen before. With the large shrine gate's legs in the background and the green fence on the right, we can kind of tell where this is, which is the corner across the street from Ammo Knights and on the same side as the manhole to hero mode. So here's what it looks like added to our map. Now, I'm obviously glad Amiibo are back because I bought the Splatoon 1 Amiibo and getting something every single game, even after I bought them, is really, really nice. It does seem that Amiibo will also save some of your freshest fits, so I guess people with Amiibo can now have even more freshest fits saved than normal players. They also allow you to get special gear, of course, and take photos with the characters featured as the Amiibo. This photo mode seems a bit more robust as the characters are obviously moving and dancing while you're taking pictures. I hope that's available in the regular non-Amiibo photo mode, but we'll have to see. We also get a brand new look at the upcoming Splatoon 3 Amiibo, and they look gorgeous. My favorite is the little buddy. He looks super dope. I'll definitely be trying to cop these when they release, but I don't know if I'll be lucky because I think a lot of people want these. Now, catalog and weapon updates will be coming out every three months or so for at least two years. X Battle and League Battle will be coming to the game in future updates. Also, small side note in this gameplay that's playing behind this is that the Rainmaker holder can get the effects from the Tacticooler, so that's nice. And we can also see a player respawn in at the top and then get back to battle fully right here. He kind of just materializes in midair, but at least we get a look at like what respawning actually looks like. Anyway, this is a good time to mention all of the website information on X Battle and League Battle. So coming in. A future update, X Battles will be the true testing ground for the highest ranking players around. You'll need to have rank S plus zero or above for X power. X Battles are solo, so there's no teaming up with friends. You'll be placed on teams with seven other top performers who have a similar X power in a particular mode. So for X rank, you'll have a different power for each mode. But for Anarchy Battles, you will not. You just have one power for every mode. The first five battles of your X rank career serve as an evaluation period to figure out your X power, as opposed to the 10 placement matches it took in Splatoon 2 to give you a power. You'll first be matched by skill level in each mode. 
Now, there are actually two regions of X Battles, the Asia, Australia, New Zealand region, and the North America and Europe region. These will determine who your opponents will be, obviously, and you'll get to select a region during your first foray into X Battles. A recommendation by the game will be provided to you, so it's a good idea to stick with that, as regions cannot be changed during the season. And remember, the season lasts three months, so it's important you pick one that you are going to be happy with at the beginning. And like in Splatoon 2, each mode in each region will have its top 500 players honored. There will be two different regions with at least right now four different modes with a top 500 for each of them. So there will be eight different top 500 leaderboards. Now, finding other players for X Battle might take a bit longer depending on the region, the time of day, and weapon loadouts, which is huge. The game will finally take into play what weapons you're playing when you go into matches, which hopefully means you no longer get matched up with three chargers on the same team or like 452 gals on the same team or anything crazy like that. Meaning that I hope all this will be more balanced. Now, joining the X Battle Elite doesn't mean you can't join Anarchy Battles too. You can pick your flavor of Anarchy based on the active modes and your own preferences. So, all of this information makes a few things clear. There are two distinct ranking systems in the game, but you can choose a region to play in. The matchmaking for X Battles takes weapon loadouts, time of day, and region into account, and each mode has its own X rank. These are all fantastic changes because it means lobbies are going to be more balanced, hopefully less laggy, and more fun. The great thing is you can still play rank modes without having to worry about losing your X rank power. So, like, if I obtain, like, a high score of, like, 2600 and I'm really worried about losing it, but I still want to play, like, Splat Zones or something, I can just play Anarchy Battles and be kind of completely fine. So, at a point, for people who reach X rank and then that's mostly what they play, Anarchy Battles will kind of be the low stakes ranked battles that they can play with friends. League battles will also be introduced in a post-launch update and consist of teams of two or four, so no tribe battles. Like in Splatoon 2 though, you and your friends will compete for a league power in a two hour window. Since they are a bit of a rowdier bunch, sometimes the residents of Splatsville go a little rogue and throw some special modes into league battles, which might hint at the possibility of maybe three team matches and new game modes entirely. This is really, really interesting, and I kind of greatly anticipate more information about it, because that's all that's said about these new special modes. But back to the direct. We do get confirmation of large-scale paid DLC, maybe akin to Octo Expansion, but it does tease to involve Off the Hook's Pearl and Marina, which is really nice. And as the direct looks to be wrapping up, we get an unknown message telling us to hold on. This is where we introduce to the new idols, all three of them, in fact. We meet Fry, Shiver, and Big Man. Their designs have sort of been hotly discussed, so I'll go over them now, but first I'll cover their names. Fry is actually a term used for a group of eels, and Fry actually appears to have three eel teeth as earrings, and you can see what an eel tooth looks like right here. Fry also says something referencing sizzle, and that kind of makes sense as eel is typically grilled in Japan, and is obviously sizzling when it's cooked. Shiver is actually a term used for a group of sharks, thus why they mention sharks calling them cold-blooded. They seem to have shark teeth as earrings as well, noted by the ridges on the teeth. And Big Man as well, a big manta ray. Design-wise, they all have these masks depicting kind of the creatures that they relate to. Fry holds a mask that resembles an eel, Shiver holds one that resembles a shark, and Big Man, a devil ray. If you were a keen viewer, you'll actually know that these masks are present in already released art for Return of the Mammalian's Hero Mode, right here. So these three definitely have involvement in Hero Mode. Design-wise, they differ from normal Inklings and from previous idols, with Big Man being the first non-Inkling or Octoling idol ever. And I've seen a lot of talk that Fry is a vampire squid, and I'd just like to squash that right now and say it's not true. Vampire squids are only called vampire in English. 
uh, they aren't even squids, and they don't have ink sacs, so that really doesn't fit the character at all. Now, inklings are seen in a variety of different shapes, sizes, and colors across the series, especially in the art books and concept art, and they can all draw from different marine life, but they are one distinct species. Fry has also gotten criticism for the large forehead, but honestly, I don't really mind, and it's not that big of a deal anyway. A lot of people thought Pearl was super ugly at the launch of Splatoon 2, and I barely hear anything about her design anymore. In terms of the uh, their other characteristics, both Inklings have different colored fingers and toes, which I think is to distinguish them and accent the new idol pose, but also it ties back to the squid at the very beginning, how it has that slight gradation from yellow to purple in squid form. The three of them together are called Deep Cut, and they host Anarchy Splatcast, which is actually in the studio we barely saw a glimpse of earlier. The director and crew actually seem to be jellies, and the studio is much larger than Off the Hook or the Squid Sisters ever used. Now, the Inkling pair seem to sit on pillows as Big Man sort of grips the TV, which displays the usual news information like stage rotations and updates. There's also a button shown to listen to the Splatcast, finally implying that we can skip the news. We also get a better look at those sea cucumber phones, finally, and learn their real purpose, which is to essentially allow you to check the news anytime you're doing stuff, which is super, super nice. We also get a message from the all-seeing fax machine that decides Splatfest themes, and we get to see the new hub at night. It's super duper gorgeous with these big paper lanterns, the inklings dancing, the big snake is glowing, the jellies are selling food, including this jelly wearing a mask, which is very responsible. There's also the, a large dragon float where the idols are and a small booth next to it, which is probably where you pledge to your team as well as tons of red, yellow, and blue decals on the screens. We then shift view to an inkling walking through the gate where the blue pig is, and we can see that the end of the street is actually a dead end here. But there's inklings and jellies dancing away and, a and another really large float in the middle of the street. Shiver, Fry, and Big Man actually dance atop separate floats as they move throughout the plaza area and then join on the big dragon float with a fan-shaped screen behind them. They finish up their wonderful dance as the new song Anarchy Rainbow plays in the background, and we can see the screen itself actually has visible pixels of red, green, and blue, which are the three that actually comprise LCD screens. Our Inkling now next explores the streets a bit to see some food carts, and then Big Man rides his float in an unknown area of the plaza that we really haven't seen over a bridge with some water and some benches and those traditional Japanese roofs from earlier. I think this might be near the alleyway we saw at the beginning of the game and the Table Turf Battle Dojo, but there's nothing super distinct that I can see that really ties those all together so I won't be putting it on the map. We do get to see some Inklings absolutely jamming out and as the narrator confirms Splatfest is obviously back and we see Fry's float literally fly in the air and this Inkling do the Macarena and another one record this whole event on their sea cucumber phone in seemingly very low quality. We also get a huge reveal that the Splatfest will now have three teams. I told you they're going to be leaning hard into this three theming. You can choose your team at the pledge box in the square like I mentioned, and in the following clip there's actually a few interesting things. One is that all players glow for a bit just after spawning in, which is possibly some sort of invincibility so you don't get splatted as soon as you land, and also that these boxes on Hagglefish Market are tangible and disrupted by the environment around them, meaning there could be other tangible items in the game that you can just mess around with, which I think is kind of cool and a nice touch. We also see once again that Reef Slider does not need to go the full distance before exploding. But the important thing is that the Splatfest will take place in two halves. One like normal with teams facing off four versus four in turf battles, and then a halftime break and report of the score. Then in the second half, the tricolor turf wars, essentially a three team battle where two of each of the losing team face off against four of the winning team to try and activate this new item in the middle of the map. In this clip, we can also see the Dynamo's vertical flick has more range than its Splatoon 2 counterpart, and once again, more evidence of the Reef Slider special exploding before it gets to its max range. 
The losing teams try to activate the ultra signal so that their respective member of Deep Cut can help them out by sending in this sprinkler of doom. This one on Shiver's team actually has those has rope-like things similar to the one that Shiver has on their head. And the symbol on the ultra symbol is the symbol that's on Shiver's fan. It also seems that there are two ultra signal symbols underneath the clock, so maybe you only get to activate them twice, or it just keeps track of how many times you've activated over the course of a map. The icons in the UI have changed a little bit. There's three colors, obviously, and a dynamic bar under each of them that shows the percentage of ink you've you have on the map so you actually get to see if you're winning or losing or contesting in real time which is really really nice the website has much more information about splatfest so i'll go over that here the splatfest t is back and it has ability doubler as its primary ability Merch requires fewer ability chunks to replace primary and secondary abilities on it, allowing you to grind chunks much, much easier. Now, as soon as this theme is announced, the Splatfest becomes front and center in Splatsville. The period between the announcement and the first match is called the Splatfest Sneak Peek. But during this time, you can cast your vote and then raise your catalog level by battling and working shifts. You will receive another special currency called conch shells this way. The number of conch shells collected by your Splatfest team during the sneak peek will actually impact the final results. Even if you can't attend the actual event, you can help your team out by gathering conch shells during the sneak peek. You can then spend your conch shells in the lobby for a chance to win items for splash tags and lockers from the large shell out machine. Once the Splatfest actually begins, though, you'll be in the first half, which takes place in Splatfest Battle Open and Splatfest Battle Pro. You gain clout, like in Splatoon 2, based on wins, losses, and points from inking turf from both modes. Clout will also impact the final outcome. Now, the Splatfest Battle Open is a is 4 versus 4 turf war battle, of course, where you can do solo or a group in teams of 2 to 4. If you're a fan of your assigned allies, you can actually choose to battle alongside them again, and if you stick with the same team and keep playing and rack up victories, you'll face other teams who have also won consecutive times to keep your competition fierce. In Splatfest Battle Pro, you'll play alone and play against other like-minded strangers, but your Splatfest power will change as you win and you lose. Both your allies and your opponents will have a similar Splatfest power to you. Now, the 100 players on each of the three teams with the highest Splatfest power will be designated as the Splatfest Top 100, also similar to Splatoon 2. Occasionally, you'll encounter a 10x Splatfest battle that can earn you, well, 10 times more clout. And if your teammates also hold a lot of festival shells, you could enter a 100x battle. These battles will grant you, well, 100 times more clout. And if two teams have a lot of festival shells and each trigger a 100x battle, a 333x battle will occur. Now, once a 100x battle or a 333x battle happens, all your festival shells will disappear. When only 24 hours remain in the event, the halftime report will be released, including naming the team with the most clout from the first half, so essentially the winner. The second half is when the tricolor turf war emerges, which pits the winning team against the two struggling behind. A tricolor battle mode will then be made available for players in the second and third place teams. Solo or duo players on the same Splatfest team can join a tricolor battle. When joining this mode, players can challenge the first place team in tricolor turf wars. If matchmaking for a tricolor battle takes too long though, you might be switched to just a normal Splatfest battle. Now as we saw, the first place team is a group of four in tricolor turf war. They're challenged by two teams of two players from the second and third place teams respectively. The team that inks the largest area in three minutes wins. The defending team will need to protect this ultra signal in the center of the map to win, and the attacking teams must try to get the ultra signal and activate it. Once the ultra signal is touched, it can be secured by challenging and charging it with ink power. Once you secure it, it sends a signal, obviously, to a member of Deep Cut like we saw. The Deep Cut member will then show their support with the Sprinkler of Doom, which gives your team immediately more ink power and automatically increases the amount of inked area you have on the map. Challenging and securing the ultra signal also increases clout at the end of the battle, which impacts the final results. Now, once the Splatfest concludes, the final results are announced, and points are given to the top teams in each category. The team with the most points wins, obviously. Now, according to the Squid Research Lab, here's how the results add up. Whoever has the total amount of votes will get 10 points. 
Uh, Conch shells per player during sneak peek will give 10 points. Individual clout from Splatfest Battle Open and Tricolor Turf War gives 15 points. And individual clout from Splatfest Battle Pro will give 10 points. And just like in Splatoon 1 and 2, you, can, you have to return your Splatfest tee at the end, but you'll get some Super C snails out of it if your Splatfest rank is high enough. And the winning team obviously gets a bit more Super C snails than the loser. Now that's everything out about Splatfest right now, well, except for this. The Splatfest world premiere is on August 27th from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So that's 12 p.m. to 12 a.m. Eastern Standard Time for those of you who live on the East Coast. And if you're a subscriber of mine, you know this is exactly smack dab in the middle of when I predicted a test fire. So I was right, baby. This Splatfest is pre-release, meaning you only get to play a demo of the game essentially, but if you check out the page on the Switch's eShop, it shows some additional information. You can actually do a tutorial and walk around Splatsville starting on the 25th, and the demo will feature 26 weapons, which is the largest amount ever in a test fire, as most, uh, most other test fires for Splatoon have only featured like, I don't know, 4 weapons? The testing range is also going to be available, so you can definitely catch me walking around, soaking in every single little detail while also verifying the map we made. Also, in regards to when the actual game comes out, players with Splatoon 2 save data will get bonuses, including three Golden Sheldon licenses that can be used to obtain any weapon at any level, the ability to join Anarchy Battle right from the jump without leveling up to level 10, you can actually start the game with a higher rank based on the ranking you had in Splatoon 2. You also get matched up with players who have similar skill level in Splatoon 2. Probably that'll just last early on in the game. Obviously, you need to have the save data on your Switch on the same user account. And speaking of save data, Splatoon 3 multiplayer save data will be stored on a server now. Which is fantastic because it means if your Switch like bricks or breaks or you can't access any of your save data anymore you won't lose your multiplayer progress but back to the direct the splatfest premiere theme is rock paper scissors and if you call recall correctly we've seen inklings play rock paper scissors before in the direct so nice foreshadowing there it actually takes place on national rock paper scissors day which is kind of impeccable timing i have to admit the gang then chats about what team they're on and it seems that shiver is team rock Fry is Team Paper, and Big Man is Team Scissors. We do get another look at their iconic pose, with their hands dangling and the three fingers waving. And after a small fake out, we get one final thing. The Splatoon 3 Enter the Splatlands Ink Inventational 2022 at PAX West in Seattle. Of note is that this was a complete surprise to the winners of those tournaments as they had no idea that they were being invited to PAX West before this, so that's kind of whack of Nintendo to spring this on them. I think, as far as I know, m most of, if not all, the teams and players are going to be able to attend, but I they could have put somebody in a really bad spot here, but whatever. Now, with that wrapped up, we have reached the end of the Direct, but not the end of my analysis. I'll be going over every single weapon kit we saw in the trailer and then covering some small stuff and information released slightly after the Direct, including in some new Japanese advertisements for the game. So here you go with the weapon kits. Tri-Stringer has Toxic Mist and Killer Whale, as shown here. Machine has Inkjet, as this Inkling with the Viking Helmet in, this tra in the entirety of the Direct only uses the Slosher and the Machine in gameplay footage, and we know that the Slosher has triple Ink Strike, so by process of elimination, the Machine has Inkjet. Sorella Undercover actually has Ink Storm, as we can see here. Range Blaster has Ultra Stamp, similar to, the similar to how we deduce the Machines kit, as this player only ever uses the Brush and the Range in gameplay footage, and we know the Brush has Zipcaster. Aerospray RG has Booyah Bomb, as we can see here. Splatana Wiper has Torpedo and Ultra Stamp. Splatbrella has Sprinkler and Triple Ink Strike. Splat Dooley's has Suction Bomb and Crab Tank. Splattershot has Suction Bomb and Trizuka. Splat Roller has Curling Bomb and Big Bubbler. Slosher has Splat Bomb and Triple Ink Strike. Google Dooley's has Splash Wall and Booyah Bomb. E Leader has Wave Breaker and an Unknown Sub. Dark Tetras has Auto Bomb and Reef Slider. 52 Gal has Splash Wall and Killer Whale 5.1. Splattershot Jr. has Splat Bomb and Big Bubbler. Sploosh Omatic has Curling Bomb and Ultra Stamp. Splash Omatic has Burst Bomb and Crab Tank. 
Aerospray MG has Fizzy Bomb and Reef Slider. NZAP85 has Suction Bomb and Tactic Cooler. Splattershot Pro has Angle Shooter and Crab Tank. 96 Gala has Sprinkler and Ink Vac. Jet Squelcher has Angle Marker and Ink Vac. Luna Blaster has Splat Bomb and Zip Caster. Dually Squelchers has Wave Breaker and an Unknown Sub. Rapid Blaster has Triple Ink Strike and an Unknown Sub. And Hydra Splatling has Auto Bomb and Booyah Bomb. Heavy Splatling has Sprinkler and Wave Breaker. Dynamo has Sprinkler and Tactic Cooler. Blaster has Auto Bomb and Big Bubbler. Undercover Brella actually is shown to have Ink Mine and Reef Slider in this Japanese ad. So either the earlier Undercover Brella with Ink Storm is the Sarella version, or they've already changed the kit. Octobrush is also shown to have Z Suction Bomb and Ink Caster a little more clearly in this ad. Also, the wiki states that Clash Blaster has the Crab Tank, the Ink Brush has Killer Whale 5.1, and the Flingsa Roller has the Tana Missiles, but I could not find any footage in the Direct or in other trailers to back up these claims, so take those with a grain of salt. Now, the Splatana Stamper, which is often referred to as the Chainsaw now, has Burst Bomb according to this photo on a Japanese site. And this Japanese ad shows its vertical slash, and the NA Twitter gives a description of it, calling it a heavy weapon that can drench opponents in ink using horizontal slashes or charge slashes. Hit them with a charge slash, then pepper in horizontal slashes while they're reeling. So essentially, it's a little bit tougher version of the Splatana Wiper. Uh, and contrary to popular belief, it is featured in the North American Direct, as I pointed out earlier, right here in this splash tag banner. So we did know about it, but only for those of us with really keen eyes. And I think that's about everything. Whew, I am tired. Obviously, there is some stuff I could have covered, like what every single piece of Inkling script says in this, but I tried to translate most of the Inkling script seen throughout the Direct, and all of it seems to be gibberish. And for where the Table Turf Battle Dojo is on our map, I'd assume it's in a small side area just past where this blue pig gate is, and that is also including that area where big man rode his float but i also don't know if any of these dudes have names so if anyone has come across anything other than just them being called staff please comment down below now overall i'd say this direct was fantastic it's absolutely filled to the brim with information, easter eggs, and tiny details. I love the continuity that the series is creating with all the shopkeepers and other stuff like that. I love the gritty and grungy feel that some parts of the game give. I love the juxtaposition of brutalism with traditional Japanese architecture in the main hub. The music. God, the music is insane! The theming and how creatively and ingeniously they've incorporated this being the third game is so fun and creative. And I already know I'll be sinking hundreds of hours into this game, collecting literally everything, exploring every inch of every map and plaza, playing every single weapon, talking to every single character, and just getting lost like an inkling in a big city would. I'm super excited to play this and also to make content for the game. And on another note, I will be creating a beginner's guide that is sort of informal, fun, and lighthearted, but is something that you can share with anyone who has never even heard of Splatoon before to help them get into the game. I'm going to be working really hard on that when the game comes out because I want this game to be as accessible to new players as possible. I'll also be doing a full 100% no damage walkthrough of the hero mode with and without commentary for those of you who enjoy it with either one. I really hope you enjoyed this video. It obviously took a very long time to make and any and all support is really greatly appreciated i hope you can obliterate that like button and demolish subscribe so you can see my journey into the splatlands and i can see yours as well let me know if you learned anything if i missed anything and what your favorite part of the direct was down in the comments below and as always i'm jext have a good one